On today's vlog, I'll be addressing something which has been concerning me for quite some time, which is this gigantic Ask Me Anything thread that's been on my Reddit board, rdigibro, for a long time. See, I started a Reddit board like a year ago, I want to say, in order to be a general question and answer board as well as an archive for all of my content, specifically with the purpose that I would stop getting asked the same questions all the time. See, I've done a lot of Q&As, and I love doing Q&As, I love answering people's questions, but when I do Q&As, they tend to be super duper long, and not necessarily well organized, and it's hard for people to actually find the answers to their questions. So I thought if I have one place that clearly states, like, you know, in the title of each post, it says, like, my thoughts on Full Metal Alchemist, then anyone can search through that Reddit, find their question, and get it answered. But, you know, it was important that it, like, the, the idea of it as an archive of, like, stuff I've already put my opinions out there on is kind of more important than the Q&A aspect, because if someone creates a thread on there and the question is, like, what do you think of Tokyo Ghoul? And the answer is, I, I watched one episode, I have no thoughts about it. You know, like, I mean, that's, I watched three, but whatever. I don't really have any thoughts on it. So... If my board constantly gets flooded with people asking for my thoughts on different shows and me not really having an answer, then it drowns out all the stuff where I did have an answer. And so I created this thread that was a sticky that said, if you want to ask my opinion of something, ask in this thread. And that would be a way to consolidate all of that stuff. Well, this thread quickly grew really enormous. And the the way like a thread is indexed on a uh, Reddit is kind of annoying, especially when a thread gets really big. And what I didn't know is that Reddit will eventually archive a thread when it hits a certain age and nobody can post in it anymore. Um, so I guess it was after like six months or so because it says it's, it's a seven-month-old post. So uh, what I would do as this thread got bigger is I would just hold off for super long periods of time and then answer a bunch of questions at once. But I had been holding off for like months and I had this huge list of questions and I just never found time to sit there and tackle all of them. And then the thread got archived. So now all those questions have gone unanswered. Now, part of the impetus for this entire thing in the first place was that, again, I have those giant Q&As, but... That was like, this whole thing happened before a time when I was vlogging all the time, where now it's much more easy for me to be like, if I just want to answer one question, I can make a video for one question, or I can, you know, like, cover a show I might not have much to say about in a vlog, like I did with, you know, Full Metal Alchemist 03 and Death Note and uh, Attack on Titan and Naruto and Bleach and all those other like big name shows that I just like I made a few videos talking about my general thoughts on each so that no one would have to ask me about them again. And while you know I'm still probably going to get questions about them because not everyone's going to sort through my whole archive looking for questions, which kind of makes the whole Reddit thing like almost pointless in the first place. Because like I mean yes, there's a search tool, but it's still an overwhelming amount of stuff to, like, go through it all. And, you know, people now are using it more as a discussion board or just to, like, send me stuff. Um, you know, just stuff that's not just an index of my opinions on things. So I also these days am not as – like, the more I get into vlogging, the more I like to be able to answer a question verbally and just be able to just rattle off what I think – because writing something takes a little bit more thought. It takes a little bit more of my concentration and like how do I want to word this and stuff. Which is why I don't respond as much to Reddit as I would if it was like a constant live stream of questions or something. Point being, I'm going to go through that thread and answer all the stuff in this vlog. Um, so it's probably going to be incredibly long. And you know... It's not an effective way to answer these questions and have them indexed forever, but the main reason I'm doing it is that I feel bad that I had this place where I literally said, like, hey, you can ask my opinion and you'll get a response, and now there's, like, a hundred people with no response. So, uh, you know, I'll just, I'm just going to respond to all these, and in the future, I probably won't open another thread like this. I'll just answer shit as it comes, and if it's interesting enough to make a video about it, then I'll make a video about it. If it's not, I might not just, I might just not respond at all. 
because, like, the amount of questions I get these days is overwhelming. The amount of comments I get is overwhelming. I don't even respond to, like, a fraction of the total number of things that are sent my way these days. So, uh, you know, I don't feel too bad about that. I'm like, it, answering everything is beyond the scope of my ability anymore. But if something's interesting enough of a question that I'd want to answer it, I'd probably just make a video as opposed to answering it on a Reddit, th Reddit thread. Um, so anyways, let's go ahead and get to it. So the first question comes from Cool Guy Zool. Hey, I was wondering how you feel about alternate English dubs of anime. In 2007, ADV Films licensed Gurren Lagann and dubbed five episodes, planning to release them in February 2008 on one DVD volume. But due to budget issues, they dropped the license and Bandai acquired it, resulting in them making the dub that we are now familiar with. I will send links of clips from the dubs to your Twitter. <clears throat> I don't know if I ever looked at those. Uh, this was asked a month ago. So, I don't watch dubs in general as, like, like, I just am not interested in English dubs for the most part. There's only, like, five that I really like, or that I, that I choose to watch over the original, I'll say. Um, and the reason for most of them is that, particularly with older anime, like, I want to say up until the late 90s, with, like, shows for kids, like, shonen action adaptations and shoujo uh, adaptations, they had a tendency to have these, like, very squeaky-voiced main characters... Like, it, it's almost like a, the way that in, in English dubs of, like, kids' shows, like, if you ever sit there and watch, like, Beyblade or something, everyone has a voice that's like, huh, you fell into my trap, you know, like that. And a lot of Japanese dubs for kids' shows are also kind of like that. And so, like, when they brought a lot of those shows to the U.S., they kind of tried to make them sound more badass. So, like, with with uh, Dragon Ball Z, for example, it's one of the shows I'd prefer to watch dubbed because the original Japanese, they had, like, an older woman voice Goku in Dragon Ball, which made kind of made sense in Dragon Ball because he was a kid and she sounded like a kid. But then they kept the same voice actress when he was an adult, and it, it's like, I cannot, I can't do it. Like, I can't listen to an old woman's voice come out of Goku, this huge masculine dude, you know, uh, and I grew up with the dub, so, like, it makes, you know, it makes sense to me to hear it that way, but, like, the Japanese is just not preferable for me. Um, the same goes for Yu Yu Hakusho. The original Japanese isn't as grating for that show, but I really like the dub. It's incredibly strong all across the board. Um, Kodocha, because I just really love uh, Laura Bailey's performance as the main character in that show. I think she killed it, and it's really fun to watch dubbed. Um, Garzy's Wing, because that's the only way you should ever watch Garzy's Wing. And Ponyo, and I guess generally any of the Ghibli movies, because Ghibli Japanese dubs are kind of weird and stilted anyways, um, and the English dubs are no better or worse, and, like, you don't want to have subtitles on screen while you're watching a Ghibli movie. But, um, all that aside, changing dubs is fascinating, because not so much for stuff like that one that you mentioned, the Gurren Lagann dub. I haven't seen either version of it. Uh, not terribly interested. But what I am fascinated with is that a lot of um, East Asian countries make English dubs. Like, for instance, uh, there's a channel that across uh, East Asia called Animax Asia. And they will dub stuff into English for Asia. Because English is a very commonly shared language amongst all all those different countries. So they will make their own English dubs, which are, like, of abysmal recording quality. I think they might have had a, a Dragon Ball Z dub. I don't know if that's the one where the over 9,000 clips comes from, because that's the, the over 9,000 is not from the American English dub of Dragon Ball Z. It's, like, a different country's version. But um, there's, like, uh, for instance, a dub of K-On!, that was made by Animax, and, like, it's just really weird and awkward and, like, terribly recorded. It sounds like it's recorded on a laptop. Uh, and then there's the English dub, and I, uh, you know, it was really funny when my friend Endless Jess was trying to watch K-On! because he kept finding the other dub, and he was like, why is the dub for this show, like, so bad? Like, because he's a huge dub guy, and even he was like, I can't take this, and then I was like, oh, it's because they, uh, they made two dubs. I do find that fascinating, um, but I wouldn't watch either version, really. Okay. From Jew, 
Hi, Digibro. What do you think of 20th Century Boys? See you, Space Cowboy. Uh, I read all of 20th Century Boys. I thought it was really cool. I love it, like, conceptually. I love the attitude of it, and the characters are great. I remember being really into Kana was super adorable. Um, and, like, just the, the main character guy was really cool. And just the whole idea of, like, having all this iconography of the 20th century wrapped up in this huge, crazy mystery story that, like, goes way off the rails. Um... I actually had seen the live-action film, the first of the live-action films, before reading the manga, and I loved the film, because it was just fucking insane, and then I read the manga, and it was like, oh, okay, this is, like, way bigger and, like, covers way more ground, um, but at the time I read it, like, I was kind of let down by the, like, by the time I reached the end, because it's extremely plot-driven, and I was very not into plot-driven shows, because I find, like plot itself not that interesting because plot is how do I put it like every plot's been done before and like adding more complexity to a plot doesn't necessarily make it more interesting it's like I always feel like I'm just waiting for the other shoe to drop especially on mystery stuff which is why I always say that I don't like mysteries because I don't like that feeling of like I'm waiting around to know what's really going on and it's almost never interesting when you learn what's really going on and 20th Century Boys has that problem of like there's there's lots of fun stuff that's going on along the way, but so much of it is, like, just holding you off on these mysteries, and you're, all the characters want to know what's going on, and you want to know what's going on, and it takes so long to find out what's going on, and then when you do, it's a disappointment, because nothing could have lived up to that hype, you know? It's not necessarily that it was, like, a stupid ending, and, I mean, it was a little... It was, like, a weird one, but, like, you know, I, I just think that anything that relies that heavily on plot is going to disappoint you when the when the other shoe drops and you learn what was really going on all right from mystery sushi to switch things up to music related opinions any thoughts on shinsei kamate chan's last two albums i noticed that you had their first two on your top 100 albums with their debut being in your top 10 but not their last two also thoughts on fishmans if you've heard anything by them i've never heard of fishmans um so Shinsei Kamate-chan, their first four albums are all on my chart. To Kill a Friend, Boring, Everything Die, and To August 32nd. All of those are phenomenal albums, all in my favorites. And it's worth mentioning, they all came out very close together. Shinsei Kamate-chan was like, they had this in insane, like, um burst onto the scene because their first album which is only eight tracks came out like early into 2010 and then they released Sumane and Minashine uh which is boring and everyone die like on the same day later in 2010 so they put out three albums all in the same year and when I found them it was through they they did the opening theme to Denpa Onato Seishun Otoko which I believe was in early 2011 uh probably the winter season and um, I loved that opening to death, so I looked into the band, and, like, what I found them through was demos. Because, like, they had almost every song they had ever made was on YouTube, but it was all demo versions. And the demos just sound insane. Because, like, they're, you know, they're, they're not, like, mixed at all. It's all just, like, very loud and abrasive and crazy-sounding music and all these, like, crazy vocal effects and just loud, on-top-of-each-other guitars and shit. And I loved it. So then I tracked down the proper albums and was able to hear all those songs, you know, like, mixed and everything. And, you know, so it took a little bit for me to get used to it, but most of the songs were kind of even better on the albums. So, um, you know, I really loved those first three. And then, like, the next year, it was, like, towards the end of 2011, um, 2 August 32nd came out. And that one is, like... Like, three or four... It's only, like, eight tracks, and, like, three of them are remixes of previous songs. And at first, I didn't like it as much. I was, like... Because it's a little bit more cleaned up. But it has some really strong songs on there. The opening track is possibly my favorite by the band altogether. Um, and just altogether, it felt like the band kind of came into their... Like, came into their own with a more produced sound. And, like, was really figured out what they were about. Well, the problem is that after that... I feel like everything they've done has just been a repeat of before, but with less intensity. Every album they've put out has been cleaner and cleaner, 
and it hasn't had any new ideas. And like what attracted me to Shinsei Kamate-chan in the first place was just how out there it was, especially because when I got into them was at a time when I was a neat, I was like not doing anything with my life, and I was just like losing my mind in my room all the time, and like so much of what they, they like is in the lyrics and the emotions was like perfectly what I felt. The song that's just... Uh, like it's just he's literally saying like i want to die i don't want to die i want to die i don't want to die and that's like all the lyrics and then the chorus is just him yelling die 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 she and like these crazy screams um ikureta neat which is abnormal neat just a song about being a fucking neat and not doing anything you know like the songs are freakish and the lyrical content was up my alley, and the idea of this guy who doesn't seem to give a fuck about how his singing sounds and will, you know, use his voice more first to sound like a girl. If, if anyone has listened to this band and didn't know this, there's only one vocalist, it's Noko. All the stuff that sounds like a girl vocalist is him just singing into voice morphers. Um, and he'll dress as a girl and, like, sing as a girl and stuff. So, I love all that. I love the whole attitude of the band. But to me, so much of it was about that raw, crazy, unkempt insanity that, you know, uh, Noko was known for the fact that he would, like, film himself just, like, he would, he would always just, like, live stream whatever he was doing. Like, he'd live stream the shows. There's times where he'd, like, he'd have someone holding a laptop on stage and he would, like, be live streaming, you know, like, vlogging while playing a show and just vlogging random stuff in his life and doing crazy shit out in public. All the videos were, like, these weird, ha- like, camcorder shot videos of him just, like, doing something, you know? Like, there's one where, uh, the one for Blues, whatever, where, like, a uh, it's just, like, him pointing a gun at the camera next to a lake, and then he, like, falls into the lake, and the whole video is just, like, him pointing a gun at his head and pointing at the camera and, like, falling all over himself. I loved it. Um, it was very gorilla feeling, you know, and sort of... A precursor to what YouTube vlogging and style has has become, you know, since. Uh, but since then, they seem like they've cleaned up so much and become, like, much more commercial, um, you know, much more accessible. Their videos are better shot. They have higher production values. And when their fifth album came out, which is called Fun, um, like, I didn't like it at all. And the funny thing is that... Um, Noko was still putting out songs, uh, like, still putting out demos on YouTube that weren't making it onto the albums that were still great. Like, they still sounded like the old stuff, but somehow the album didn't sound anything like that. And so there was kind of this divergence where, like, some of my favorite songs by the band did come out in that era, but none of them were on the albums. Or if they were, then they came on later albums and were, like, mixed more tamely. Um, So then they had uh, Hero Syndrome, which... Like, was a little bit more experimental, but I still wasn't really into it. And I feel like they've gotten overly reliant on the same song structure of just, like, it's just a five-minute power ballad song with uh, that, that reaches a crescendo and has some, like, glittering pianos, you know? And, like, the first track on to August 32nd was already, like, the perfect execution of that, and every other song since feels like a weaker version of that. So, um, haven't been into it. They just put out a new, like, EP that is just kind of more of the same. Um, and then there was also, like, uh, Noko did, like, a remix album where he, like, took a bunch of the best Shinsei Kamate-chan songs and, like, re-released them with, like, higher production values. And I was like, this is exactly what I don't want. I want you to go back to the old sound of, like, crazy insanity, not update it to this new stuff. So, I don't know. I'm sure that, like, you know, for a lot of their audience, I'm sure they're more accessible now to a lot of people, but for me the the niche that I appreciated them for has kind of, you know, is not really what they're going for anymore. And, uh, you know, I'd still put their first four albums in my favorite albums, but it's not quite the style of music I'm as into these days. Um, you know, I don't have that raw, unhinged need to hear something fucking crazy in order for me to relate to it. Uh, although I still am huge into Death Grips, which kind of fills a similar hole. Um... But, you know, these days I listen more to chill music just because I'm usually chilling out most of the time. That was a long fucking rant for that answer. Um, This one will be easy. Uh, A Little Misleading asks, thoughts on Yuri Yuri? I don't get it. 
I, I only watched like the first two episodes of season one. I didn't really find it that funny. I, one of my friends put on an episode of season two one time. I didn't find that that funny. I don't really find the characters that endearing um, or cute, really. It, I don't know. It, it, it feels so weirdly hit and miss for me with, like, what cute girls shows I like versus other people. Because, like, people seem to think of me as, like, a guy who loves Moe stuff. But, like, uh, you know, Yuri Yuri and um, and Nun Nun Biori are, like, the two shows that everyone else seems to really like from that style. And I just don't get it at all. Um while I'm at it, not very big into Milky Holmes or, like, uh, any of those shows that are just, like, really dumb girls, I guess. Uh, which, my brother Shade loves all of those. Huge into Yuri Yuri. Um, alright. This person's name is deleted? Or maybe this post was deleted? Yeah, I guess this person's account was deleted or something in the time since answering this. And and this was answered by Lock Kuhn, uh, which is Lachlan Still. Or the pedantic romantic on YouTube. But I'm going to answer this anyways. So this guy said, Recently listened to this old podcast with you and Best Guy talking about Kill La Kill. Link if anyone else sees this and is wondering what I'm talking about. So you had some problems with the series, which I found to be pretty undeniable, though I had just overlooked them when I watched the show, so I guess they didn't bother me. You said in the podcast that you would give Kill La Kill an 8 out of 10, though now on your mal it is a 10 out of 10. I'm wondering if you had ever talked about why you changed your mind on some of the problems you have with the series, assuming that you even have changed your mind. To which Lot Kuhn responded, He did indeed change his opinion of the series after that podcast. If my memory serves right, he read an article slash blog post about the allegory to Jap Japan's boring states period that Kill La Kill creates and grew to appreciate it more. And then he found the post Kill La Kill a love story. So, that's mostly correct. What really happened was that I was at Otakon in 20... What was it? 2015? I guess? No, 2014. Yeah, 2014. Uh, at Otakon 2014, I attended a panel about Kill La Kill by a guy called Charles Dunbar, who runs a website called The Study of Anime, and he's, like, a huge panel guy. He goes to, like, a ton of different conventions and does tons of panels. He always does several at Otakon every year, and, uh... He was very passionately into Kill La Kill, and he gave this enormous rundown of how Kill La Kill parallels uh, basically the entire Warring States period of Japan, both thematically and in, like, what happens in the show. Like, the whole thing is practically one big allegory. And through that explanation, I was able to understand the themes of the show better, because what in the initial podcast that me and Nate did, both of us were just kind of confused about like what the themes were. Because th it seemed like it was going one way, and then it changed after a certain point, and both of us kind of got lost by that change. But once I heard Charles Dunbar's explanation of the, the show's themes, it all clicked and it all made sense. And then those themes became really powerful to me. So then when I watched the show again, like, knowing all that stuff, then I was like, oh, shit. Like, you know, it all makes sense now kind of thing. Kill La Kill a Love Story is a blog post that, uh, on a website called An Eye for an Eye Piece, uh, I'll put a link to this post in the description, as I've done for a lot of my Kill La Kill videos, uh, where this guy sought to, he was like looking at all of the discussion, all the critical discussion of Kill La Kill all over the internet, and he tried to like compress it all and then break it all down and like figure out what's really going on. And a, a big part of his post is the Charles Dunbar thing, like re-explained, because he also like, uh, you know, took from that post and, and, uh, and added it to his own. But alongside all this other stuff, it's a huge, massive post that takes a long time to read, which is probably why I haven't successfully gotten a lot of people to read it, but it is well worth your time. Um, I wish he would do a video on it just so it would get more attention. Maybe I'll ask him if I can or something. But, uh, yeah, just basically reading those interpretations of the show and then taking them on as my own dramatically improved my, my feelings about it. Uh, and... You know, it was just kind of like like everything clicking in place. Like it's I I really like the show, but I was so confused about it when we did that first podcast that it like it kind of ruptured it. It's kind of like that feeling when you know when you just don't quite get it and it it's like it's hard to get into something if you feel like you don't understand what it was trying to do, you know? And then once I did understand that, then it was like, "Oh, okay. Now I can just appreciate what this is." 
um, as opposed to just being lost. So, yeah. Now I'm a huge fan of the show. Definitely 10 out of 10. Definitely in my top 10 favorites. It's hard to, like, convince people about the show because, like, a lot of people are like, anime is not supposed to be smart. It's it's supposed to be entertaining in the show. I shouldn't have to read a whole dissertation to understand it. And, I mean, if you don't... I mean, if your stance is, I have to understand everything in the show or else it's shit, then, then like it's really going to come down to whether or not you understood it. But now that I do understand it, nothing is there to st- stand in my way. You know, like, like reading the dissertation has now changed my outlook on the show irreparably. It will never be the same. I can never go back to not knowing these things. So as far as I'm concerned, it's uh, it's a 10 out of 10. Um, all right. Wet Fish Zero asks, Hey Digi, can you possibly analyze the irregular at Magic High School to show what it does well and what it does not so well in developing its sci-fi setting? It would be satisfying to watch for reasons. I'm asking because I'm a sucker for well-explained science fiction to the point where some of my favorite music tracks are literally this is where we explain scientific and societal exposition tracks. I have a problem. I haven't watched the irregular at Magic High School. I have no desire to do so. But there is a video series, I don't know if it quite goes into what you're hoping for, but there's a show, uh, a series called Sucks or Not, um, Irregular at Magic, or Maho Koko no Retose, by a guy called Anime Addicts, which is really solid. Anime Addicts was a guy who was only around for, like, the early part of last year. He was trying to basically be the YMS of anime. Um, His Sucks or Not series is basically the Your Movie Sucks thing. Um, and he was getting really good. His Aldenoa Zero series in particular was, like, choice. Um, not Aldeno Zero. I meant, uh, that one was okay, too. But his, uh, one on Zanko no Terror was great. And it made up for my video on that show being terrible. Um, my last, the one, the unlisted one. Anyways, I recommend his videos. Unfortunately, he stopped YouTubing, uh, like, midway through last year permanently, as far as anyone knows. So, uh... You know, it's worth checking him out, but uh, don't expect anything new to ever come out of him. All right. Lokimon266. Hey, Digibro. I'm just starting out in anime, and I was wondering if there are any shows I could watch. What are your suggestions? 250 anime recommendations. I have a video about it. Uh, Another deleted user. Sports animes such as Diamond No Ace or Kuroko No Basket? I guess you want to know my thoughts on them. Uh, I haven't watched either one of them. Um, Generally... I think sports anime are cool. There's only a few that I have, like, a particularly strong love for, which would be, like, Baby Steps I'm a huge fan of, and Hajime no Ippo. I haven't watched a whole ton of it, but I have loved what I've seen. Um, I feel like with sports anime, because they're all so similar, it's like I kind of just want to watch the best ones, and anytime I see one that I'm just kind of, like, lukewarm about, I'm like, I'd rather be watching Baby Steps or Hajime no Ippo. Uh, Eddie Paster asks, Hey Digibro, are you a Run the Jewels fan? I was watching your SAO2 video and noticed a lot of their instrumentals. Yes, I am a big fan of Run the Jewels. Um, it's just great. I love both albums. I would have a hard time... I, I want to say I like the first one more because I kind of like the whole thing, whereas the second album, there's a few tracks that I just find totally forgettable, but the second album has a few of just the greatest songs ever. I want to say... Uh, fucking Close Your Eyes to Encount to Fuck, or uh, Oh My Darling Don't Cry. Both of those are phenomenal. Um, from the first album, the song, uh, Didn't We, do- Job Well Done, it, that has, like, both of the verses in that are, like, two of my favorite rap verses of all time. They're just so goofy and over-the-top and uh, incredible. Uh, sea Legs, great song. Both pretty great albums. Soul Cake Eater. Current thoughts and opinions on My Little Pony. Only the show. I don't want to hear anything about the fandom or anything, just the show itself. I kind of went through all of this in Insomnia Analysis 2, so go check that out. Um, for me, the show and fandom are kind of irreparably connected. Like, they, they, they're they inseparable in my mind to some extent. Uh, but I also just don't think the show's good anymore. Or I don't care about it anymore, at least. 
Uh, Girl Melancholy says, Hey Digi, I tweeted at you, I think yesterday, with a question and realized I chose the worst possible place to ask you, so I'm going to try and redo this. I was wondering why I don't see many reviewers or current talk about Welcome to the NHK. It is my favorite anime slash series ever, and I found it about two years ago. I know it came out quite a few years ago, and the reception I have seen is really positive, but it never received quite the reception that I would have expected. It doesn't seem as well known as other popular animes. Maybe I just missed a hype wave that people just forgot about, or maybe I am wrong in thinking that everyone would like this anime as much as I do. Anyway, thanks for reading. Any insight you would have on this would be much appreciated. Um... Yeah, I think the biggest problem is just that it's older, um, and it really depends on where you're looking for, because, like, it came out in 2006, so definitely before YouTube, definitely, uh, you know, in the earlier days of anime blogging, and people don't look back at old shows all the time, and I mean, NHK is pretty, for for being the kind of show it is, is actually amazingly well-beloved, because people... Nothing outside of, like, action shonen stuff ever gets that big. Um, so NHK is has a pretty sizable following for a show that's as weird and out there as it is, especially from 2006. Like, that... Most of the other shows of its nature are, like, forgotten gems or, like, indie darling type stuff. Like, stuff from, from that era that's that weird. So, um... Yeah, I'd say it's surprisingly successful. But the... Uh, Lock Kuhn pointed out that there are videos from Under the Scope, Gigguk, Bob Samurai, and Jeff of Mother's Basement, so those all exist. Um, and I think uh, Pseudo Steph has one recently as well, so yeah. Abraham Link asks, thoughts on Filthy Frank? I think his videos can be pretty funny. Um, I followed him for a while. Kind of got sick of him because I feel like all his videos are the same, you know, especially the ones where it's like a rant about something. It's like, like the underlying theme is always the same. People are dumb for doing this thing. Uh, sometimes they can be funny, sometimes they're not. I prefer the videos where it's just crazy fucking insane stunt shit, like the, like, modern jackass kind of videos because they can be so, like, gross and physical and over the top that they can be funny. Um, but... I don't know. I kind of got sick of his shtick and haven't really been following him anymore. Um, Ocon X D S blah 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 blah. Blah. What kind of year for analysis videos has it been for you? It's been pretty great. Um, this has been a very solid year. I don't think we have had anything on the level of like the top two or even really the top three from last year from my top ten list. You know, best guy ever had his Gurren Lagann video, which is like the big, huge, end-all, super edited, 40 minutes, every detail about the show analysis. And I think that, like, I love that genre, but I think it's a dying breed. People are starting to realize that, like, there's a huge amount of diminishing returns that comes from trying to put together something that, like, over the top and ridiculous. It's like 90% of the effort is for 10% of the result, you know, like... Like, my videos are all edited very quickly, and it's all about, like, writing and editing as fast as I can while the idea is still fresh. And those videos still are very appealing, they're very rewatchable, people still appreciate them, people still consider them to be amazing videos that they're going to come back to again and again, people still consider them worth patroning. And if I spent, like, 900% more time editing those videos, then, on the one hand, they will be overwhelmingly perfect but it's like for i think for the average viewer that's like kicking a 9 out of 10 up to a 10 out of 10 you know like people already love my videos on the level that they're already at and so going so far over the top to make the perfect video you know you're only getting so much more reward out of it it doesn't really get you any extra views or any extra fans people you know, they love it more, but they only love it so much more. And, like, the the biggest problem is that you can only do one of those a year, you know, or one every six months. And so it's such a, a hassle to, like, try to do that over and over again. And, you know, I think everyone's kind of coming to terms with that and realizing that, like, it's fine to do that every once in a while, but it's a lot more, like, sustainable, both for, like, 
monetary reasons and because it's just what your audience is going to want. Your audience wants more content. You know, they don't want they don't necessarily want every single video to be a perfect jewel if it means that they only get one every 6 months when they can get something that's great all the time, you know? So like I think we're going to have more and more people trending towards that, trending towards like mo- more what I do and uh I'm okay with that, and I still think we're getting tons of great content, and, like, you know, I mean, taken as a whole, I would still think of the asterisk War sucks as, like, is my favorite analysis video, like, ever, you know? Um, so I still think we will get, like, some artistic masterpieces, but I don't know if there's going to be another horseshoe finale or another, you know, best guy, best anime ever, Gurren Lagann. I think the best I can hope for is that we'll get more what you're going to do. Like, you know, because Endless Jess is always going to come up with crazy inventive shit that doesn't necessarily take a fucking year and a half to produce like horseshoe finale did, but it's still like next level stuff that uh, that still blows you away. Um, and he still has been. He's put out a ton of great videos. Um, the most, like, exciting new crazy concept analysis video this year was probably Watch Out for Rolling Rocks, the Pan and Coic video about Super Mario 64. Um, there's been, you know, new people on the scene, great new stuff coming out. There's, there's, it's been expanding. Like, there's been more analysis videos this year than last year by a long shot. There's more people doing it, new faces coming in. Uh, whether you really consider them analytical or not, uh, Mumkey Jones is a new guy who's been fucking killing it. Um, you know, most of his videos are, like, comedy-focused and stuff, but he just did this, like, very serious 30-minute video on Elliot Roger, and, like, that shit was genius. So that was fucking great. Um, you know, we've got guys like Captain Christian who are doing the whole nerd writer thing, but kind of taking it to another level. Uh, it's all around great. My only complaint would be that some of the familiar faces have not really been active. We've had one Matthew Matosis video this year, and it was the Devil May Cry commentary. I don't remember any Every Frame of Painting videos coming out. Uh, like, I'm sure there were some, but they were, like, way back at the start of the year. Um, you know best guy ever is still fucking takes an eternity uh so yeah my biggest concern is that like some of the big names that i that i miss aren't aren't getting as much stuff out but overall solid year all right uh lock kun asked you mentioned fantasy star universe briefly during your pso playthrough as being pretty different from pso i'm considering picking it up how good or mediocre do you think it was it's really good um the biggest differences are that there was basically PS PSO was fun for the local multiplayer for me. Like me and my brothers all played it together on a couch. There is no local multiplayer in Fantasy Star Universe. I don't know if you've already picked it up, by the way. So I don't know if this is actually helpful. But Fantasy Star Universe was had a single player story mode where you, which was like you don't even customize your character. You're like playing an actual story game, which was like mediocre. And then it has online play which was great it was you know everybody's good as pso1 and uh and and had more advanced controls and stuff but the lack of couch multiplayer was kind of like oh you know um but then they made pso2 so like it's kind of pointless to even try fantasy star universe now because there's fantasy star online 2 which is free to play um it's only in japanese but there's english patches that are out there me and my brothers have played it extensively it's a great time so i recommend that uh, over PSU. I don't even know if the servers are still up for PSU. Um, Little Scuttler says, Hey, Digibro, been a fan for a while now. Was just wondering whether you ever picked Knight of Sidonia back up. I remember watching your thoughts of it on Digida's anime and found myself in that niche you explained. Watched it and really enjoyed. I just got done with the second season and wanted to ask you this. I do agree that the main character is pretty dull, but the world to me is very interesting and some of the later mech battles and such became very epic and engrossing. That's about it, really. Uh, well, you could have just looked at my anime list and seen that I still have it dropped. Um, I keep my anime list completely up to date. Every time I watch a show, I immediately mark it. So anytime anyone asks me, like, are you still watching this? Go to my anime list. It will have exact data. Uh, but yeah, whatever I said about it back then is the last thoughts I've had about it. Um, Winter Wacko says, Conrad, why have you not responded to any of the questions here? Well, I explained that at the start of this, so already answered you. Don't call me Conrad online. It's weird. Not that I, like, I don't, I'm not trying to hide my identity or anything. It's just weird. Because to me, 
being called Digi Bro is how like it it lets me know how I know you. Like if I hear Conrad, I expect to turn my head and see someone who I know offline. And if I hear Digi Bro, then I immediately get that you know me from the internet, and it gives me context into like who am I about to talk to, you know? Um, like if someone walked up to me at a convention and was like, "Hey, Conrad," I'd be like. Did I go to school with you? Do we? Did I work with you or something? But if you come up and say Digi Bro, I'm like, okay, you know me from the internet. Uh, Sailor Steve 420 says, "What is Nisio Isin's best light novel? Not series, but the one book you think defines him as an author the most?" Well, I've only read uh, <laughs> I've only read one of his books. I read Zare Goto Book One. Um, I don't read fan translations of light novels. I am not into that. I think I've never seen one that I didn't find like repulsive. So, uh, not gonna bother with those. Uh, I do own Kizu Monogatari, but I haven't read it yet. Itetsu asks opinions on Kiznaiver. That guy over at Wrong Every Time made a nice point about a quote in one of the episodes. Who cares if it's overdone? It's true. Talking about cliches in both the show and Okada's writing style overall. The show feels very quintessentially Okada. Uh, I still haven't watched it. I'm on episode one. It's the next show up on my list. Um, I agree that it seems quintessentially Okada, though. Uh, like right from the beginning, I thought. Right from when I heard the description, I thought that. And then watching episode one, I was like, "This is the o- the most Okada thing possible." Um, I feel like I owe Okada another video. I made a video about her, um, just explaining her style in general. I feel like I want to make a video about how Okada's not a bad writer because uh, I don't know if that deserves a whole video, but like. I'm sick of people, like, shitting on her for, like, totally unjustified reasons. She's written tons of great stuff, is overall very solid, and, um, and she's, like, like, people were, like, shitting on her for, like, Mayo Iga, and, like, she wrote that, like, from what I understand, she didn't, like, come up with it or anything. It was all, like, the director's idea, and she literally just, like, wrote the script based on what she was told to do. Um, so it's not like it's her original concept or anything, not that that necessarily, like, forgives it, I mean, I liked the show anyways, but, like, I don't know, I feel like she's a, she's a, she's an art, she's a writer who's become a meme in the same way that Urobuchi Gen has, where, like, people just shit on them because it's, like, one of the two anime writers people actually know. No one knows anime writers other than Butch Gen and Mary Okada. Those are the only two people know. So, like, you know, it... I don't see people going around shitting on Yusuke Kuroda or something. Like, I don't know. It's annoying. Uh, Jack the Unpleasant asks, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, how do you feel about it? I have some videos about JoJo seasons that I've seen. I think it's pretty cool and fun. Um, I don't think I'm nearly as into it as most people seem to be who, like, watch it, but I, I like it. Kameson Matheron19 asks, what's a day in the life for you? Routine, etc. That's a great question. Um, there is no routine at all. I wake up when I wake up, usually in the late afternoon. It could be anywhere from, like, the most normal times for me to wake up would be anywhere from 12 to 4.30 these days, like 12 uh, p.m. to 4.30 p.m. That's like the the main time I wake up. So when I go to bed is usually between uh, like anywhere from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. Uh, that can completely change at random. Sometimes it changes because I have like a dentist appointment at 11 and then I stay up till 11 and then my sleep schedule completely changes. Uh, but it's most common for me to be up at night and asleep for most of the day. And I prefer it that way because that's how I get the most shit done. Um, during the daytime, I have a tendency to wander around. I like to just, like, walk around the house, laze about, talk to my brothers, um, go out to eat. I'm a huge fan of going out to eat, so, you know, I'll take every opportunity I can to get out of the house, go eat something, um, just hang around at, like, a bookstore or something like that, and then just sit around and watch YouTube videos until it's nighttime. And then, like... After, like, a certain point in the night, like, some... It could be anywhere from, like, 8 p.m. to maybe even 1 in the morning. Somewhere in that point, 
somewhere in there is a point where like I, I don't want to sit around anymore and I want to start working. And what's great about having that moment in the nighttime is nothing can distract me. Nothing can just come up and take me away. Where like if I were to say start working at 4 p.m. And then at 6 o'clock, my brother comes in, and he's like, hey, want to get something to eat? And I'm like, sure. And then we take a break, and then I might not get back to what I was doing. Whereas if it's 1 in the morning, and I'm like, I'm going to sit down and write this fucking video, then I will probably do that for six straight hours with no interruptions. So just the best way to have, like, a long stretch of time that I that if I get into something, I will be able to stay into it would be at night. Um, you know, it's not till like, anywhere from 6.30 to 8 o'clock that, like, anywhere's gonna even open for me to go, and everyone's gonna be asleep. Uh, and also, the internet's more dead. Like, if I'm up during the day and I get on Twitter, then I'm gonna be stuck there, because, like, there's people around that I can talk to, whereas at, like, 4 in the morning, there's barely anybody on Twitter, so I can't, like, be distracted by, you know, talking to people online or getting into conversations with my friends on Discord. That's always been a huge problem. Like, if it's, like, 5 p.m. and we're all on Discord and, like, one person starts an argument, we are all trapped for hours. Whereas at night, there's no risk of that. No one's awake. I don't have to argue with anybody. So it's just generally a great way to not get distracted is to only be awake at night. Um... But besides that, it's just, like, eat every six hours or so. I try to, like, really make sure I don't eat more than that because I'm trying to, like, lose weight right now. And uh, I just don't leave the computer that much. Like, most of my life is on the computer. When I get ideas for vlogs, I just turn on the camera and start talking. You know, I have, like, a bunch of good vlog setups. I just plop the tripod down, turn on the camera, and I go. Uh, when I have a good idea for a script... I think about it for a little while and then try to get it written. Um, in the meantime, I watch disgusting amounts of YouTube videos. I watch so much YouTube. I keep up with every channel I follow. Like, there's almost nothing that gets posted by any of my, what is it, 120 subscriptions or something that I don't watch. Uh, with the exception of, like, some live stream recordings and shit like that. Uh, and lately I've been marathoning Casey Neistat vlogs, like, constantly for weeks. Um, and if I'm feeling particularly productive, I might watch a whole anime in a night. That's another good reason to, to be up at night, is that it's very easy to start an anime at, like, 12 and finish it by 6 in the morning, like, right when the sun's coming up, and it just feels like a perfect, like, I spent my day doing that, you know, uh, so yeah, I guess that's essentially what a day in the life is like for me. You know, nothing happens with regularity. Like, if I take a shower, it's because I, f I feel like I need a shower. That could be any time of day. Sometimes I shower when I wake up. Sometimes I shower right before bed. Sometimes it's in the middle of the day. Sometimes it's because I just went for a walk, you know. If I'm hungry, it's because, like... You know, if I wake up at 6 o'clock and I'm hungry when I wake up, I'll eat then, then I'll eat at 12, then I'll eat at 6. Um, right now that whole schedule's been moved back because I started up a crock pot at 9.30, which was three hours after I had last eaten, and that has to cook for six hours. So I'm waiting a long time, and that's why I'm recording this right now, because I needed something to distract me for the next hour before my fucking food is ready. <laughs> Dopey Man says, can you review or give a small opinion on Dopey Time, which has a link to something called Dopey Time? It appears to be an album. He linked to a, uh, a Rate Your Music page. Um, let's go to YouTube and give Dopey Time a listen. I hope it's short. It's not short at all. It's well over an hour long. Sounds kind of fun. Might give it a full listen later. Evangelion asks, Do you think publishers like Viz and Dark Horse should try to publish each volume in the day or at least week of the Japan release? It would likely boost sales for the series since it wouldn't be months or even a year behind Japan. It wouldn't get people to just read the scans online. Yeah, I do think that would be helpful. I think simultaneous releases should be, you know, like something everyone's considering all around the world. Um, it's not likely they could do that with print at all because... Uh, like, how are they going to predict what's going to be popular, you know, before it even starts running? Um, 
I mean, if it was like One Piece, like do a current volume of One Piece right at the same time. But I mean, even in Japan, like they're going to they're going to be reading the scans online either way, because Shonen Jump is where those get published. And then it'll get collected into volumes until much later. And we don't have a Shonen Jump anymore. We have a digital one, but like it's got to be digital. But if they did do it digitally, it could work possibly. Um, yeah, I personally, I think I just would love to see the manga market expand dramatically uh, my biggest problem with manga, like, both with scans and with releases, is that I think we are getting a shockingly small variety of it. Um, like, with anime, every season, 43 new shows come out that are all totally different, and all of them get subtitled. Either because they're picked up by one of the major streaming sites, or if they're not, then someone will come along and do the job. Unless it's, like, a like a fucking three-minute children's cartoon that nobody cares about like these days everything gets subbed with manga that is not even remotely true stuff that's in really major magazines usually gets scanslated and even then if it's not popular it's going to be super late um you know stuff that people are talking about or excited about stuff that gets an anime adaptation but there's such an ocean of interesting manga that is just not available to english speakers in any way not through fans not through official means not through anything and i really feel like for me the hardest thing about getting into manga is that i have to kind of stay on the beaten path of like what's popular like you know, if I want to read shonen manga, then I'm good. If I want to read, like, some of the the better-known trippy art house stuff from, like, the really auteur people who, like, everyone knows about, like, in Inio Asano or something, then I'm good. But there's so much, like, weird little things that look awesome that I'll see, and I'll be like, oh, I want to read that, and there's no way to do it. So, like, one of my biggest, like, long-term goals that I've had for a long time is just to learn Japanese just so I can read manga. Like, learning to read Japanese is the only way I'm ever going to experience as much manga as I want to. And I know, like, the one of uh, the anime bloggers I've been following forever, Ogiwe Maniacs, pretty much did that. Like, he, he, he reads Japanese, and he's always, like, posting about these awesome, crazy, weird manga that he finds because he can, you know? Uh, and I'm super jealous of that. Xbox 360. What do you think of Battle Angel Alita? Do you think the manga will get an anime one day? A lot of old manga like Parasite, Ushio, and Tora are being adapted into modern anime these days. Can the same happen with Alita? Do you think the live-action movie of Alita will be good? Will it be better than the live-action Gits movie? Pretty please answer this question, Digibro. Um, I've always wanted that live-action Alita movie to come out because I think James Cameron would be a great fit for that movie. He's the one who has the rights to it and was going to direct it. He keeps pushing it back to make Avatar. I don't know if he'll ever make Alita. It would be nice if he did. Um, if anyone other than him does it, I'll get worried. If anyone remotely related to the Gits movie does it, I'll get worried. There was an anime adaptation of Alita. It was only two episodes in the 90s. It was cool. Um, I doubt they'll make another one. And the reason is, with Parasite and Ushio and Tora, those have contemporary settings. They both just take place in Japan. Uh, I think it's pretty easy to adapt them. Neither one has, like, crazy art or anything. Alita is ex is cyberpunk in, like, this very detailed way. Like, everything is, like, lots of wires all over the place, lots of, like, uh, you know, it's, it's from, like, the Katsuhiro Otomo Akira era of, of cyberpunk. If they did it today, they would definitely do it in CG. There is no question they would do it in CG. It would probably be the same team who did Blame, or is going to do Blame, and did Knights of Sidonia and, uh, what's it called, Ajin. Like, they're the only people I could see doing it. So it's possible if they do it. But if not, I don't see it happening. I don't think we're going to get a 2D animated Alita. Because the, just the level of of detail and, like, unique setting design that would be necessary to make it come to life is just not financially probable, uh, which is probably why they never made a full TV show out of it in the first place. Um, all right. The Slow Play says, I dig your videos, and it's nice to see you critically analyze anime. Even if I don't always agree with your taste or opinion, it is always well thought out. Anyway, I found this rather obscure anime that is a spinoff of Armored Trooper Votoms. Have you seen Armor Hunter Mellow Link? How do you feel about 80s anime? That's a jump to a much larger question. 
Um, I haven't seen Mellow Link. I've heard good things about it from my robot friends. Uh, I also haven't seen much of Votoms. I've only seen the first three episodes. Um, it seemed interesting, just never continued. Um, 80s anime has always been difficult for me. I think a lot of it is just the sound. Because 80s anime tends to sound like shit, like, in terms of recording quality. Like, everything sounds like it's recorded on, like, an 8-track or something. Like, some... It, they all sound ancient. Um, and I have a hard time, like, concentrating on those sounds. Like, that flat, sort of, a. Uh, uh, staticky sound that those uh, recordings tend to have. Um, I love the aesthetic of 80s anime. I have grown to love it even more over time because when I was younger, I really did not like space at all. And now I can deal with space. 80s anime also just tends to have a very different style of directing. It's a lot slower and often less dynamic and expressive. This is not always the case, but like... Just in general, I feel like 80s shows feel very different, and not always in ways that I like. Uh, so it's it can often be hard, but there's certain 80s shows that I really do appreciate. Um, I like a lot of Gundam, I like a lot of Macross, but even having said that, I haven't finished almost any of the series from either of those. So, yeah, I don't know. I've always, I've like, getting into older anime has always been like, the the hardest thing for me, but the thing I've wanted to do the most. Like, I feel very bad about the fact that I don't know older anime as well as I should. Like, I feel like, uh, the biggest reason I've never done a video, like, the most classic anime, here's a list of all the classics, is that I haven't seen so many of, like, what is considered a classic from the 70s and 80s and even the early 90s. Lucktins asks, on planets, ever intend to finish it? I don't know if that's how you pronounce the name of that show, but yeah, I do intend to finish it. I watched the first 10 episodes and really enjoyed them a, like, eternity ago. Um, just never got around to the watching the rest. I bought the whole manga recently, because they released it in two big omnibus volumes, and I just wanted to have it. As I understand it, the manga and anime are quite different, so I'm interested to uh, consume both. Axelis says, I remember a while ago in your talk of how lazy the anime meta is getting, you mentioned how there was nothing remotely subversive about current anime, but they keep telling the joke like it'll be funny again if they just tell it enough. Recently I was watching Flying Witch and all I could think of was that video. Not because I think Flying Witch is bad or falls too deeply into the tropes, but because I really do feel that it breaks the genre's old trend of fan service and crappy meta of today. It may reach a little... It may reach a little on how far it wants to go to break the norm of anime, but seven episodes are currently out, and it is honestly my favorite anime of the last two years. The real thing I wanted to ask is if this anime would make it into any of your videos in the future, and what are your opinions on it are? Well, I've covered Flying Witch in the the first of the Finish or Fail for 2016 videos, I believe. Um, yeah, I don't know that it's trying to, like, subvert any cliches. It's just a different genre. It's an Iyashi K show, and they've always kind of been like that. I think... Like, for people who don't like Slice of Life, it all just looks the same to them. It's all cute girl shows. But, like, uh, I would highly recommend this video by Subsonic Sparkle, where he broke down the four different types of Slice of Life shows. That there's some that are more, like, about being just cute and, like, having cute girls. Some of them are more about being funny. Some of them are more about being relaxing and contemplative. And... Flying Witch definitely falls in with the more relaxing, contemplative side, where we've got Amanchu this season, we've had Arya in the past, stuff like Natsume Yujincho, and anything else along those lines. Mutsuto says, You may be interested in this video if you're not subbed to Under the Scope Reviews. How Kaon's Moe coming-of-age story breaks convention. I did see that video. Um, I thought it kind of just made a lot of the same points as my Kaon video. Um but it was, like, more accessible, I guess. Like, looking... My, my biggest problem with my K-On! video is that it's kind of, like, all over the place. Like, it's very manic because it was me kind of realizing that K-On! is my favorite show and then trying to explain why, and, like, everything in it was a revelation to me while I was writing it. So it's very, like... Like, every time I talk about some big point, I was, like, coming up with that point as I was writing it, and it was exciting me, and I was, like, going way off the rails with it. Um, so his video is more structured, I guess, but also just a lot more boring. Um, I don't know. I have a hard time 
He's he's one of the uh, the people who I think that he makes some interesting points, but it's kind of like the videos are a lot longer than they need to be and kind of recursive and like go through the same motions over and over again. So I did like his video on what is a deconstruction though, although even that could have been like 40% the length. Incubus Mind Game says, also your thoughts on Kuchu Buranko would be appreciated. I really liked it. I loved that show. It's uh, weird and fun and it makes you feel great. I, j I think like whenever I think of Kuchu Buranko, uh, mostly what I think about is the ending theme because every episode would, would be about exploring some characters like psychological problems and then they would sort of have this moment of like clarity when things kind of turn around and then it would have this epic crescendo into the ending theme, which is Shangri-La by Denki Groove, awesome song. Um, and just the way it feels to like have that moment of revelation and then have that song start playing is, yes, it's so tight and I love it every time. And that's like all I think about when I think about that show. Alex Grau says, okay, so I stumbled on your YouTube channel and I thought, this is exactly what I need. Your thoughts about Asterisk War proved to be very helpful, but I would like to know which exactly writers' decisions, such as twists, tropes, etc., do you think would make most mediocre and boring action-packed anime in high school plus magic sort of setting? What? If anyone else can offer an example, I'll be glad to hear slash see. Come on, internet, help me out here. Sorry if spelling is a little off. I'm non-English speaker. Okay. Okay, let me try to interpret exactly what this person's asking. I think he's asking which, like, what decisions would make a show, like, as boring as it could be. I mean, I get everything the Asterisk War did. Asterisk War is the most perfectly, like, shit show there is. Like... There's other shows that are that are possibly like worse or more offensive than the Asterisk War, but in I think like almost everything else is more interesting just by virtue of like having any idea. You know, like uh I know uh Mother's Basement always goes on about Maburaho and how that's like his like the bane of his existence. But that show's premise is like in just insane enough that it's like at least memorable because the premise of the show is like the, the, all the girls want to fuck the main character because uh, he has, like, perfect genes and, like, they'll get a perfect offspring if they fuck him or something like that. Like, that's hilarious. Uh, even if the show is complete garbage, that is one little spark of creativity. Asterisk War has nothing. There is nothing about it that is in any way interesting. It is the most perfectly bland show in existence. And I would challenge you to find <laughs> to find something more perfectly bland, um, like even something like like I can think of like Absolute Duo is like around the same style of show, but that show is like a really great OP, so like automatically better. I guess Asterisk War is an okay ending theme um, and okay music, but even then, I can't I can't really give it credit. Uh, anime Rambler asks, do you think anime is art? I think everything is art. I have a very postmodernist approach to art. I think it's all, it, everything's, why, why the fuck even distinguish between art and non-art? Like, what is, what is the point? Where is it helpful? Like, how does that distinction help anybody? Like, the way this bottle is designed could be considered artistic, right? Like, it has an aesthetic value. I don't think it was intended to be art. It was more intended to be, like, something that that is, like, made to, you know, be, like, easy to hold and easy to use. But, like, it takes a vision to be able to craft this. Like, it takes an imagination and an ability to, like, to, to, to craft things in a certain way. And, like, if someone drew a picture of this bottle... Would that concept design be considered art, like, before it becomes the bottle itself? Because it certainly inspires me. Like, I think it's... Look at this. This this thing, rather than having, like, a pull-out tab like most bottles do, it's got, like, this thing that, that goes into the cap, and then you press a button and it shoots open. So it's not growth. How is that not art? That's an art. Arts and crafts. All right. Hikari015 asks, Have you read the manga Byorg Trinity, drawn by the mangaka who made Air Gear? If so, what do you think of it? Would you make a video on it? Never heard of it. 
Um, I have heard of Air Gear, but I haven't read it. Uh, Voltism asks, what do you think about Suki Monogatari? I saw your video about the older Monogatari's and the newest one, but not Suki Monogatari. So, uh, one day I'll cover the rest of the Monogatari series. I covered a whole ton of it back in 2014. I want to revamp that video and modernize it and give it a full video effect because it's one of my favorite things I've ever written, the Monogatari series analysis. Like, I adore that video. It is... Because it's, it's like, the point of it was to be an analysis of, like, how self-indulgent the series is and, like, when it's being interesting and when it's just being indulgent. And for the analysis itself to also be self-indulgent in my use of language. And I think it, it, it nailed it perfectly. Like, the tone of the video is exactly the same as the tone of the show. And that's what I love about it so much. Like, I wrote it as if... I were writing Bake Monogatari uh, as an analysis video. So I absolutely adore that video. I love the use of language in it. I just want to correct certain things, move certain things around, maybe add some clarity in places, and then have Devu edit a full video out of it so that it, it can have like a, you know, a legacy. And then I once, at some point I'm going to cover the rest of the show, but I wanted to wait. Like for a long time I was saying I was just going to wait till the Kizu Monogatari film was out, but now that it's a trilogy, that's kind of rough, but I do have book one of the novel, or I mean, the, I keep saying book one, but it's just one novel. I have the Kizumonogatari novel, so I can read that, use footage from the film to, like, you know, match up with what I'm saying, even if it's just the first film, and I can analyze that story along with the rest of them, and then, um... I've heard there's, like, one arc left that needs to be adapted. So, like, once that comes out, I'll probably make a big second video on the Monogatari series. Nathan Hark Madmen asks, Hey, Digi, I read one of the commenters here and learned that you are, or were, working on the same idea that I have been working on myself, rewriting SAO. I'm interested in hearing your ideas for reworking SAO, and I would like to present my ideas to you as well. Although na now, as I am feeling a wee too lazy to convert my notes into a huge wall of text slash story. If you're interested, I might be easier to just talk to each other via Skype or something, blah, blah. So, yeah, uh, if you go on to my Reddit on rdigibro, they're in search for, like, rewriting SAO or something like that. I made a huge fucking post of all my ideas. I had a vocal thing, like a... Uh, like an audio file that's like 45 minutes long of me explaining my version of SAO and then a bunch of text notes afterwards. And then I started actually writing a script treatment. Um, I think I posted parts of it up and I was like really getting into it. And then um, I was planning to have a video and this might still happen uh, where I explain the whole thing and have like an animatic behind it in the style of the what if the Star Wars prequels are good were good videos. Um kind of just fell off the wagon because it was like a huge project and initially because I, I wanted to have it so uh, I have this animatic but I wanted to pay for it I was gonna pay the artist Ben Saint um, but in order to be able to afford to pay him as much as I wanted to pay him I would have to do a Kickstarter for it and I wasn't sure if people would be willing to donate to a Kickstarter for that uh, but now I make way more money than I did back then. So it might be feasible to just fund it out of pocket. I'm not sure yet. Uh, Ben is moving in with me in a month. So those plans will definitely be coming under the microscope again. And I also don't know how much time I want to spend on my SAO rewrite project because it was becoming like, I was getting obsessed with it and writing like a lot of stuff for it. But, uh, I don't know. Who knows? Maybe it'll still happen. This comment is fucking enormous. Rocco52 says, Hey, Digibro, I can't quite recall in what videos, but I feel like you've mentioned Birdie the Mighty Decode in passing a few times. What are your thoughts on it? That's like part one of this huge comment. So, uh, oh, I guess the rest of it is just him explaining his relationship with the show. So, I'm not going to read all that. I'll just share my thoughts. Um, I watched the show back in 2007 or 8, whenever it aired. Um, I remember enjoying it. Don't really remember much about it. I It was the kind of show that I was just like, yeah, that was okay. And then, like, promptly forgot about. Uh, I mean, it was good. I never watched season two, and I always wanted to, because I saw all these, like, Sakuga mads, like, this crazy fucking fight animation that they put in there. But, um, never got around to it. Uh, I feel like your story is probably more interesting than mine, because this is a huge comment about his story. 
Uh, Ampharos for Life asks LCD sound system. I've tried listening to them like once, just didn't really seem like my thing. I'm not into like super long repetitive songs for the most part. Writer's Blah says, Yo, Digi, I just watched your video on scores, and there's something that I'm not sure I've understood properly. With what you've said in the past, that objective critiques don't actually exist, which I absolutely agree with, do all of your scores directly reflect how you personally feel about the show and how much you enjoyed it? I ask this because I see a lot of people of immediate recollection from my anime list specifically saying stuff like, well, even though I really enjoyed the show, looking at it critically, it deserves a low score. Is this a load of bull, or can there be a disconnect between personal opinion and the actual quality of a show? And if there is, what should a personal score reflect more? I think it's kind of bullshit, but I understand, like, I think it's wor worthy to make a distinction between, and I made a video about this, like, between appreciation and enjoyment, um, where, like, if you have an appreciation for a certain style of writing, then, like, you will recognize it as something that to you is good, even if you don't personally enjoy it. And this happens to me all the time, uh, where there's certain stuff... A great example would probably be, like, um, this is... I don't know. This, I don't know if this is a great example, but Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. I deeply appreciate what that show does more so than I actually enjoy it. And I do enjoy it a lot. It's, I mean, I think it's a very strong show, uh, and I I like watching it. But, like, in terms of appealing to me, it doesn't necessarily do as much as other shows. Like, a show like uh, Kill La Kill. Like, Kill La Kill super appeals to me, whereas uh, Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood doesn't have, like, a lot of elements that, like, that are relevant specifically to me. But I have such an appreciation for the way the show is constructed and how much it follows, like, all the rules of, like, what conventionally people look for in a big action show. Like, I really feel like Fullmetal Alchemist Brotherhood is, like, the ultimate anime. Like, it is the anime that does what everyone wants and does it all perfectly. Um, you know, obviously some people won't like it. Some people will be outliers to that. Some people might even prefer the original show for this or that personal reason. But, like, in terms of, like, capturing the, like, greatest consensus idea of what should anime be, I think that show does it perfectly. So I appreciate that. And if I was basing my scores off of appreciation, then I would give that a higher score. And that's what I think people really mean when they say objective, because you can't really have objective quality. Like, who is to say that just because the most people would agree that FMA is perfect automatically means it is perfect? Like, wh how, why is my personal opinion less valid than the broad consensus opinion, you know? Consensus is just consensus. It doesn't, it doesn't reflect a universal truth. It's just something that a lot of people think. Um, so... If you want your scores to reflect that, go right ahead. But interpreting consensus is a losing battle because, like, while I just said all that about FMA Brotherhood, it's not necessarily true. Like, there's no way to, like, prove what consensus is. And, like, you know, as much as people will try to have, like, their critical self, like, what's popular is what's popular. And people will always say like, oh, popular doesn't mean good. But then like, what does mean good if not popular? You know, it's, it's a rocky road to go down. So personally, I really think that if you're going to be like, if you want your scores to be meaningful, the best way to do them is to make them personal. Because if you try to make them like a, a universal standard type thing, then you're, you're barking up the wrong tree, essentially. John Live asks, hey, Digibro, what's your opinion on dinosaur porn? Also a big fan of your videos. Well, I can't say I've seen a lot of dinosaur porn, so I don't have much of an opinion on it. Uh, Wafer Disco asks, how do you feel about Kokoro Connect? I haven't seen it yet. Um, I am interested. Boo Burn asks, what did you think about Nadia, The Secret of Blue Water? I kind of shared all the relevant thoughts I have in the 250 anime recommendations video. I also wrote a post about it on my blog way back when I watched it, so uh, that's probably the best I'm going to get. Tom Moza 23 asks, did you ever read Koe no Katachi? If yes, what is, what is your opinion about it? Uh, do you plan to do a video about it? I do not. I have not read it. Um, they're making a movie out of it, and it's being directed by Yamada Naoko, who is one of my favorite directors. She directed k and Tamako Market and Tamako Love Story and assisted directing on Hibike Euphonium. She's amazing. k 
Kyoto Animation's making it. So hopefully it's great. Um, yeah. Shocks12345 asks, opinion on Oregairu. This has been answered uh, well by my uh, videos since that question was asked. Anime Rambler asks, in a video you said that Glass Reflection Review of Sword Art Online is shit. Do you think all of his videos are shit? If so, why? I don't remember having said those words exactly. Actually, no, it was probably in the SAO uh, comment response video uh, because I was pissed off about something. But um, I'm not a fan of his style of videos. They're very much just standard reviews, and I always feel like he just kind of reflects back whatever is the most commonly held opinion about a show, or what he thinks will be the most commonly held opinion about a show. Um, I'm just not into standard reviews. I don't get the point of them. Like, what? why? Why bother? Just watch the shows yourself if you need an opinion on it. Legato Red Winters says, So I've been watching anime for a year now, and this is my current taste in anime. What do you think about it? And he sent a link. Oh, this is like... I'm not going to go through all this. There's a whole fucking... It looks all right. Penta Ultimate 2 says, this, is not, this isn't so much of a question, but in regards to your latest Digibro After Dark video, I don't think that reaction towards Kill La Kill is necessarily split per se. Nowadays, whenever I encounter any mention of the show, it's usually praised under a positive light, be it mentioned in some random anime subreddit or some Crunchyroll slash Anime News Network review. Much of the hate I've seen towards the show is found in the comment section of your Kill La Kill video, surprisingly enough. I found it pretty weird because A, those videos always had a large number of likes that dwarfed the number of dislikes, and B, well, all right, the point of all this is, everywhere you go, depending on, like, where you hang out, you will always see a wildly different perspective. I've had so many times where someone will comment on a video of mine, like, I didn't think anyone liked this show, and the show is, like, the most beloved thing of all time, you know? It really just depends on where you're looking and who you're talking to and how broad your perspective is. So I like to go to as many different sites as possible and try to collect as many different perspectives as possible. If you go on 4chan, on A, Kill La Kill is very divisive. If you go on Reddit, um, it's pretty well liked, but they don't really seem to think it's that deep. If you go on my anime list, it's just barely in the top 100 of highest rated shows if you don't count any sequels. Um... So, like, it's it's definitely well-liked, but it is controversial, and different people have different stances on how good it is. There's a lot of critics who think that it's stupid or that it doesn't have a point. Demolition D was pretty harsh on it. Uh, Nino hated it until, like, he, you know, kind of changed his stance a little bit once he started hearing ar- counter-arguments. Um, people, there, like, there's so many different opinions. If you read that Kill La Kill a Love Story post that I was talking about earlier, he really deep dives into, like, a lot of what the different stances on the show are and tries to, like, sort of reconcile them all against each other. But, yeah, it's always going to be different depending on where you're looking. I'm going to go get my food now uh, and let these clips off of my camera. Okay, well, I just threw down, like, a huge bowl of chicken and, like, a uh cabbage and shit so if i seem like more gassy and coffee than i was before that's why let's continue this thing erdelf says well i watched your videos about sword art online and the video about log horizon i was forced to watch log horizon what exactly do you like about this show in the analysis video you strangely enough avoid going into details like you normally do your basic point in the video where it wasn't sao and it had a good uh, food as a plot point I'm only asking because I liked your SAO videos, especially the one about the first season, and nearly every problem you mentioned is more than doubled in Log Horizon, especially everyone praising the protagonist, so I'm a little bit confused. Maybe you can clear that up for me. Uh, Watch the videos again, maybe. Uh, I'm pretty sure I said a lot more stuff than that, and I'm pretty sure I also defended the way it handles its protagonist, which is that it makes sense for him to be good at the things he's good at. The problem I had with Kirito is that he's a fucking 14-year-old who is somehow better than everyone else at the game. It's not just that people tell him he's better. It's not just that they worship him. It's that he's legitimately better in the context of the story, which only starts becoming... Like, I have a headcanon that he's a new type for specifically for VR games, which is like a Gundam thing, but that justifies it for me, Which, uh, but that's more of my own personal fun thing. In Log Horizon, the main character has been playing this game for, like, ten fucking years or something like that. Like, he's a long-time 
veteran of the game he's playing. He's been a part of one of the biggest adventuring guilds ever for a long time. He's a hardcore tactician. He's in his element. Like, there's no reason he wouldn't be amazing at what he does in this game. Uh, you know, it, like... I don't really see Shiroe as like a like audience stand-in protagonist, even though he, it's easy enough to take him that way, just because he's a kind of typical-looking Japanese gamer dude. Like, th- it's just that he's in a world where what he is good at is something that is helpful to be good at. But like, saying that it's like weird for him to be like a great man who people respect would be like saying that there's no one in the real world who's like that you know like there's lots of great leaders out there and people who are who do great things so he's just one of those um you know he has his major character defects namely that he doesn't know how to communicate with people or connect with people and he ends up being very standoffish and uh to an extent that is clearly not for a purpose, that he just doesn't know how to deal with people and isn't trusting and doesn't know how to open up, and it's a problem, and it becomes a real problem, like, later into the series. Um, so, you know, it's not that he's without flaws. Private Chicken asks, How much do you think first impressions should inform your overall opinion? Do you ever find a need to totally revise your first impression? Personally, I had a very bad start with Cowboy Bebop and left unchecked. It made for a very mediocre viewing experience. I'd be content to leave it as middling show in my mind, if not for the absurd preponderance of positive testimony. This is the most extreme situation I can imagine that suggests review of my blah blah blah. Um... I mean, obviously, I take first uh, impressions pretty seriously, considering my whole series of videos on, uh, what, like, how you can recognize a great or terrible anime pretty quick. But, um, you know, I change my mind about things a lot. Like, the corollary to that whole video series would be that your taste can change, and it's not always going to be the same experience. When I was younger, I did not like Ghost in the Shell Standalone Complex at all. I thought it was super boring. I passed out watching it. Um, I dropped it after eight episodes, and I just kind of thought that, you know, people liked it for being like a political drama, and I was not into that. And then as an adult, I watched it again, and I absolutely loved it, and it's one of my favorite shows. So, you know, the first impression I had of the show is kind of inconsequential now. Like, it has nothing to do with my feelings on the show anymore so like who cares that's why i always say like <clears throat> i said in a recent video on uh writing like giving writing tips that i don't want to hear about how your first impression is different from what it is now if that's not relevant because like you know if 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 my ghost in the shell video had started off like i used to not like this show but now i like this show here's why then the fact that i didn't like the show is no longer relevant to anybody. It doesn't matter. It's not relevant to me because it's no longer representative of my opinion. It's definitely not important to the audience that my opinion changed, you know, uh, by virtue of growing older. I do actually mention it later into the video just as a way of talking about how I feel like the show uh, has an intellectual slant and is kind of aimed at an older audience. Um, So in that case, it was kind of relevant, but... Mecha G11, hypothetical, I know your interest in the Game Grumps has faltered, but would you guest star in a Grumps episode if offered? Absolutely. Uh, of course. Um, someone asked in follow-up to that, Andy Castaneda asks, Has it faltered since 2015? Where did he mention this? I was surprised to hear him say he watched them every day, so it'd be even more surprising to learn he stopped. I definitely think they faltered this year. Not so much last year, but this year... It fell off the wagon. I talked about it a lot on Digibros. People got sick of hearing me talk about it. Uh, but I just think that they got really stale and ran out of things to talk about. And uh, it got boring to watch. Um, Mauricio CS asks, What's your opinion on Concrete Revolutio? The story is pre- presented in a weird way and you either have to pay attention to the date or you have to read the timeline. But in my opinion, the characters and visuals are good. The premise is good. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, I've only seen the first two episodes so far, but I think it's pretty cool. Um, it took until the end of episode two before I completely wrapped my head around what the fuck was happening. But once I did, I was like, okay, I get it now. Um, it's definitely interesting. And I definitely want to see season two because it's different writers. 
uh, and it happens to be a collaboration between two of my favorite writers ever, um, Kazuki Nakashima, who wrote Kill La Kill and Gurren Lagann, and Urobuchi Gen, who you probably know. He wrote Psychopaths and Madoka. Uh, MC Banana Cheese said, You dropped Shigatsu after one episode. Why is that? Referring to Your Lie in April. So, Your Lie in April is one of the most unfair drops I've ever done. Um, not that I think I should pick it back up, because it's definitely not my kind of show. But, uh, so, during that season, me and my friends were sitting around just, like, clicking on random new shows and checking them out. And uh, we clicked on that one, and all of us were instantly bored. None of us cared about what was happening. Um, I was only kind of half watching it at first, and then, like, you know, paid more attention towards the back end. But I, it seemed absolutely like something I would hate. I cannot stand, like, that brand of teen melodrama, like the very heavy-handed teen melodrama. Because it's basically characters giving a lot of shit about things that I don't give any shit about. Um, especially from that early end. I can deal with it when you ease me into it. Like, a show like Toradora, which is one of my favorites, like, it does get into some kind of obnoxious melodrama in the later part of the show, but by then I'm so endeared to the characters that I do legitimately care about what they're going through. Um, I still think some of the melodrama in that show is badly handled, but, like... Nonetheless, it's, you know, when a show just starts off right out the gate, like, this is a show that's gonna make, gonna try to make you cry, and it's gonna be about these characters and their life problems, and I'm like, I, d I don't want this, you know, get it away from me. Uh, and I, I had put out a call to action asking people to analyze the show, and one guy took up the call, rewatched the show, ended up hating it like he had loved the show before watched it again ended up hating it and made an analysis video about how shit it is and it was fucking hilarious i loved that uh it was like 20 minutes long <laughs> um ezekiaru yt asks i am starting to get curious now that i've watched a lot of your videos digi is there a particular reason why you tend to blink a lot when you record yourself are your eyes sensitive light i already answered this in my uh, what's wrong with my face video uh, Lost My Pass Again asks, do you listen to Buckethead? Are his fans obnoxious and favorite track? I don't think there's a lot of Buckethead fans roaming around anymore. Uh, I don't really listen to him, though. I've heard his albums before, not really my style of music. Um, <clears throat> Andy Castaneda asks, I just want to know what you think of all my favorite YouTubers, but most of all, I want to know what you think of the rap collective Pro Era. I highly recommend looking into their music and the work of Captain Steez. I think you will really enjoy reading into the work of Steez specifically. The depth to his lyrics is something I know you'll really appreciate. Uh, I think I listened to one Pro Era tape that came out like the end of 2013, I think, because um, the Needle Drop had reviewed it, and I thought it was pretty good. Um... I'm not super into, like, the classic boom-bap style of hip-hop, where it's just, like, a repetitive beat for four minutes and just, like, straight bars over it. Like, I really appreciate the technical skill that those rappers usually have, because they're usually, you know, they usually have incredibly great lyrics and flows. But, like, I prefer songs that feel like songs, like, where it's not just about the rapper, it's about creating a cohesive song and, like, having a structure to it, so... Um, I might be off base saying this, but that's how I remember Pro, pro Era being. Uh, one of the YouTubers I want to know if you follow is Max Landis. I think you two are very alike in your creative process in that it just comes from an unending well of passion. Edit, I heard you talk about Max several times now. Yeah, um, I have talked about him. Uh, funnily enough, have not seen any of his movies. Um, it, not even, like, I haven't seen any of the ones he's written or the one he directed. Uh, haven't read any of his comics. I just know him as a YouTuber, um, as a result of wrestling isn't wrestling, and I love his videos, and he's a huge part of what inspired me to start doing these vlogs, because of the fact that he would just record the shittiest quality vlogs imaginable, and they're still interesting. Another YouTuber I'd like to hear your opinion on is Bennett the Sage. I haven't seen much of Bennett the Sage's stuff, but what I've seen has been horribly annoying. I cannot stand him at all. Uh, he just, he, I don't know, he... He seems like kind of a douchebag, and uh, his opinions about Evangelion are 
fundamentally wrong. Oh, and hey, you're really into transhumanism. Have you seen the animated short World of Tomorrow? I have not yet. I've heard a lot of great things about it and have wanted to watch it, but I haven't seen it yet. Uh, Mr. Tangelo says, Yo, Digi, I know I made another comment already, but I gotta ask, what is your opinion on Patema Inverted? I really, really want to, really, really want to know. Uh, I did not like that movie at all. Uh, I really haven't liked any of that director's stuff that much. Like, I remember when he first came out with, like, Pale Cocoon and, pe and like, Mizu no Kotoba, and people were, like, tripping out on it because it was, like you know, really pretty, really thoughtful short films that were, like, made by, like, one guy kind of thing. But uh, I wasn't that impressed with them. I'm not that into, like, short films that try to just be, like, one emotional point, you know? Because, like, for me, I can't get attached to something without time. Like, I really require, like, something longer if I'm going to, like, get, you know, intimately involved with the story. Um, which is why most of my favorite anime are in, like, the 26-episode-plus range, uh, with very few exceptions, which are mostly Hayao Miyazaki films. Um, so, like, I wasn't that into his style, and then Patema Inverted was just obnoxious and stupid. Like, the plot is stupid. Uh, it, it's boring and slow and goes nowhere. The characters are completely bland. Um, the big twist ending, uh, by that point, I didn't give a fuck, uh, I just didn't like it at all. It's like, it, there's a certain brand of, like, adventure romance story that, uh, I think Eureka 7 perfected and, uh, Nadia the Secret of Blue Water had done really well before that. Both of those are, like, quintessential examples of this. Um, and there's lots of stuff that tries to do it where it's, like, mysterious cool girl and, like, a more normal boy who, like, uh, you know, is I infatuated with her. And they have some kind of adventure that brings them together. But the funny thing about Patema Inverted is that it kind of has that, but it also is not really much of an adventure. Like, it takes place in a very small amount of space, in a very boring amount of space, like... The underground world's not that cool. The surface world is completely boring. Uh, it doesn't cover that much ground, and it's, it just kind of sucks. The characters aren't good. Uh, I didn't like it at all. Super boring movie. Um, another Mr. Tangelo question. Hey, Digi, what are your opinions on the YouTuber Demolition D+, also known as Douchebag Chocolate? Do you generally like his reviews, or do you not really enjoy them? I am a big fan of his. I think he's pretty great. I loved his video on Aldenoa Zero, I mean, yeah, in particular, um, and he's done some good stuff. I like his Evangelion analysis series, is really spot on, and uh, was a huge part of what inspired me to finally start talking about the series, uh, but I do think he's gotten kind of stale lately, where his videos have become more and more about just, like, the crazy over-the-top editing, and less and less about analytical points or saying something new. Um, like his Umaru-chan video, I didn't understand why that video needed to exist at all. It was just very strange that it even was there, uh, and I just kind of felt like a haze wash over me. I want him to do more analytical stuff. He promised he was working on this angel's egg analysis, like, well over a year ago. I don't even think he's working on it anymore. Uh, but I always wanted that, and I haven't gotten it, and instead I've gotten just, like, pretty casual stuff. Uh, Brimstone, Brimstoney14 asks, favorite film directors? By the way, have you seen Funny Games? Really recommend it if you haven't. I haven't seen it. My favorite film directors, this is honestly a little hard to say, because I, I barely watch movies at all. Um, it's been a long time since I've, like, sat down and watched a bunch of movies, like, God, what's the last one I even saw? Uh, I remember, like, I saw Zootopia in theaters, and then I remember there was, like, a comically long time until I saw another movie. I saw The Jungle Book, and both of those were pretty okay. But, like, uh, you know, if I had to say who my favorite film directors have been in the past, Quentin Tarantino has always been by far my favorite. Um, Pulp Fiction and Glorious Bastards and Kill Bill are all among my top favorite films of all time. I like Wes Anderson a lot. I only got into him in the last couple years. Really love Moonrise Kingdom in particular. Uh, Royal Tenenbaums is great and Darjeeling Limited. Um, I like the Wachowskis mostly for Speed Racer. 
uh, gonna glance over at my movies. I like um, I like Ridley Scott when he's doing great movies. Uh, the Martian and uh, Kingdom of Heaven and Blade Runner are all among my favorite films. I still haven't seen Alien yet, so I need to do that. Uh, but yeah, those are all like top ten probably type films. Uh, yeah, I guess that's like the majority of the film directors I like really strongly love their movies so oh and i guess uh what's his name the guy directed Shaun of the dead and hot fuzz and scott pilgrim and the world's end his name is slipping my mind right now he's really great all those movies are like just shy of my favorites list like none of them quite is like a top 10 favorite movie for me but they're all very close all right Egg Palm 3 asks, Do you like the band King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard? I've been jamming out to their new album, Nonagon Infinity, over the past week and thought it might be up your alley. They're pretty okay. I've listened to both their albums. Uh, none of it, like, jumped out at me to a point where I felt the need to, like, listen to it again, but I didn't dislike it. All right. Uh, this is, like, a whole conversation between a guy named Rapester and uh, Lock Coon. He says, I've recently found your channel and watched your videos on why the Astro Score sucks and why you drop so many anime. <clears throat> you and I share a lot of views on anime, and I'm constantly amazed at how often you manage to give the same criticism I have to my friends, but more eloquently. However, I noticed you dropped Gate, noting it was largely an anti-A1 Pictures bias. I'd like to ask you to reconsider and give it another shot. The show breaks tropes left and right, blah, blah, blah. Uh, obviously, I have since this given Gate another try and wrote that whole video on hating... Uh, hating, um, current, uh, whatever. Terrible first episodes of anime. Um, Schmilsberry asks, how's Osumatsu-san and or Kumamiko? Uh, I dropped Kumamiko after episode two. Osumatsu-san, I've only seen the first episode. Uh, I plan to give it more of a chance just because it's so popular and I know it changes considerably in the second episode, so might as well give it a look. Um, J1R3HPV asks, what do you think of Animal Collective pre Weather Post Pavilion besides uh, Spirit, They're Gone, Spirit, They Vanished, specifically Person, Pitch, and Here Comes the Indian? I don't think Person, Pitch is considered an Animal Collective album. I believe that's just a Panda Bear album. And Here Comes the Indian, uh, it's weird. I'm not super into it. Like, Spirit, They've Gone, Spirit, They Vanished is by far my favorite of their albums. Like, that's the only one where I love the whole album. It's just so, like, it's such a, a journey, and it's one that I still feel like there's a lot of mystery in it for me. Like, I haven't listened to it so many times that, like, I totally know the whole thing. Um, all their other albums, like, have a few songs I like. Like, Meriwether Post Pavilion and Strawberry Jam and, uh, and Centipede Hurts. Those are my three favorites. They all have, like, a handful of songs I really love, and then the other ones I think are okay. And then all their other albums have too many songs I don't like for me to really, like, listen to it repeatedly. Here Comes the Indian just kind of sounds like a bunch of fucking improv crazy shit. It's not bad, but you know, it's not that memorable. Uh, <clears throat> Lee Gray asks, thoughts on Endless 8? I haven't seen it yet. Also, thoughts on anime OPs, visuals not the music, that just cycle through pictures slash motions of the cast individually and splatter their names and text on the screen, such as Clannad, da da Phantom World, etc. I personally fucking hate this because it just kills what I want the OP of a show to do for me. It's supposed to get me hyped for the show with the combination of images and music because blah 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 blah. Uh, I think it's unfair to put da 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 in the same category as those other two shows, considering that da 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 has the whole in inventive... You know, every shot kind of leads into the other one thing that they uh, they reuse from Bakano. It doesn't do it as well as Bakano, but it's still pretty cool. And all the characters are awesome. They're all doing something interesting, like lifting a fucking vending machine or something. So, uh, But generally, those kinds of OPs are pretty fucking boring. Um, okay. Huck Hakiro 4. What, what are you waiting to see Evangelion 3.0? It's so strange, the film in general. Thanks for everything. Uh, just haven't gotten around to it, and I figure I might as well wait for the fourth one, since I've waited this long already. Uh, Outsin asks, thoughts on H3H3 Productions? Pretty cool. I uh, only got into them 
fairly recently. I actually liked their Ethan and Elo content more than H3H3 H3 in general. Um, I will say that, like, I think that, like, I like Ethan and Ela as, like, personalities. I don't find them that funny. So a lot of the times when they try to do, like, a more comedy-focused video, it can get tiring where, like, Ethan will kind of hammer on a joke for a while and I don't really find it that funny and so I just kind of get bored. Um, but overall, they're okay. Um, I think they are at their best when they do, like, the really polished stuff. Like, the the 90s boy band video is definitely my favorite uh, H3HD video altogether. Um, <laughs> all right. The, that Tick says, Hi there, I saw your review of Baby Metal with the needle drop, and I was wondering if you could point me in the right direction to find info on the album tie-in to Sayonara Zetsubo Sensei that you mentioned. I can't find it. Thanks. It's called Kakurenbo. K-A-K-U-R-E-N-B-O. It's probably all on YouTube. Uh, Freven asks, Thoughts on Homestuck's ending? I personally find myself really confused about what my opinion even is regarding it, but... Uh, blah blah blah. I haven't read it yet. Not even close to caught up on Homestuck. I haven't read it in years? I'm gonna say three years behind, which is not that much in story because it was on hiatus for like a fucking year and a half, but uh, it's definitely plenty. Um, Rami Res asks, just want to say thank you for your recommendation of Psychopaths. I'm up to 18 and fu- episode 18 and fucking love it. Cool. Uh, Will the Dill asks, Gintama? One of my favorite shows... Um, the only reason it's not in my favorites list, or given a score, is that I've seen 160 episodes out of 200 of the original show, uh, and I haven't watched any episodes in, like, three or four years, um, except for the first two episodes of season three when that started airing, because it, it was, like, new and I just wanted to watch it, and I confirmed it's just as good as I remembered, so I'm confident that Gintama would be in my top 10 if I finished it. I kind of feel like I want to rewatch the entire 160 episodes, but like I feel like I'll never finish the show if I do that, which is why I haven't. But at the same time, I'm also not finishing the show anyways. And I feel like 40 episodes will be enough for me to like rediscover my feelings and give it a score, you know, like which I mean it's going to be a 10 because the show's fucking amazing. So um, I don't know. I just think I got, I got to get around to finishing it, man. Uh, John, John M. Santi asks, what do you think of Martian successor in Nadesco? I don't think it's the best since things in sliced bread, but I do think it's charming as hell and pretty bold in their interpretation of the giant mecha genre. The art style, the way it chastises and praises the characters of anime viewers for their fandom. I love this series. Yeah, it's great. Um, I really enjoyed it. It's cool. I first watched it because of the fact that it's the favorite anime of this guy called Omoe Kane, who is an anime blogger that I've been following forever, and he was the admin of the Mega Tokyo Forums anime section, which is where I sort of got my start in anime blogging. Um, And it was his favorite show, and he would always talk about how, like, the more he thought about it, the more intrigue he could pull from it. And, like, he described it... I remember distinctly that he described it as a... A a uh, a high class jerky where the more he chews on it, the more flavors it releases, and uh, I always thought that was interesting. Haven't watched it since two thousand eight, but I still remember a lot about it and it being a great time. So highly recommended for sure. Also, Amperzan asks thoughts on the new Jontron vlog. He thinks it's shitty, but I am oh, it's his best video in ages. I agree. I know what you're talking about. It was his Blizzard rant. Me and all of my friends were like, oh my god, this is so much better than everything else he's been doing. And this, like, on the, it's a little upsetting because the only problem is it has shit audio, right? Like, he he was treating it as a vlog, so he didn't try to, like, set up audio or anything. But if he just had taken it the slightest bit more seriously and realized that a vlog can be a great video and just hooked up a microphone, 10 out of 10 video. Would have been one of the best videos of the year. Um... But instead, it's just, like, a suggestion of so much greatness that could still be brewing inside him. Um, Rabbit's Foot 99 asks, thoughts on School Rumble? I've only seen the first episode almost ten years ago. Uh, Ultimate Scorpion asks, what do you think of a bridge series, mainly Dragon Ball Z abridged and SAO abridged? I have only really seen Yu-Gi-Oh abridged. Uh, I was really into it 
when I was young, like a solid 10 years ago. Um, and I've, I think I've watched most of like the newer ones. Uh, it was pretty okay. Like the main fun of it for me is that I grew up watching Yu-Gi-Oh and he does all the voices so accurately that it's like perfect. And, uh, had a lot of fun memes and shit. Never found Dragon Ball Z abridged funny. Uh, only seen the first episode of SAO abridged and I haven't really watched any others, uh, that much. Armageddon Don't Let Me Get In asks, Hey Digi, hey Digi, hey, what do you think of No More Heroes and its sequel? No More Heroes is super fucking cool. I played most of the first game. I never beat it. I was on, like, uh, boss, like, the, the rank number three boss. Um, and I think I watched my brother beat the ending. And I love the bosses. I love the dialogue. I love the aesthetic. I did not love everything you had to do in between boss fights uh, or the fact that I had to play it on the Wii. But otherwise, really cool game. Um, I love that it's... I'm I'm a big fan of the what I call the the uh, the Seven Psychopaths genre, which the movie Seven Psychopaths is a commentary on this genre, where it's just like a movie about a bun or a story about a bunch of like really strong personalities all just clashing with each other, which is like what Bakano and Da Da are like, and what No More Heroes is like. Um, Dead Rising borrows elements of that in its boss battles. All the Tarantino films are basically that. Just, you know, these movies about a bunch of, like, cool, weird, quirky badasses in one place. And uh, No More Heroes has a great take on that story. And it's probably the best take on it in video games. And it's cool. And I love that it has all these nods to Takashi Miike films. And it definitely, like, feels like one in places. Especially the ending. Uh... Queen Dogma asks, what was your opinion on episode one of Kotetsu Jono Kabaneri? Well, obviously, you've you've learned that by now. Uh, Scootaflu asks, haven't you seen you do many videos reviewing video games recently? What's your opinion on Super Smash Bros. Melee and how it's evolved since 2001? Uh, it's cool. I can't really speak on, like, a deep level about Melee. Uh, my favorite video about Melee is the one that was done by Innuendo Studios called A Thing of Beauty. Um, something about Smash, I don't know. Look up Innuendo Studio Smash video. Uh, it's really good. Um, I haven't really talked about video games lately because I haven't played a whole lot of them. I did, I was really into Dark Souls 3 and Doom this year, but, uh, they were well covered by a million other people. There's, there's just no room for games analysis. Like, everyone's doing it, and everyone's covering all the ground I would be covering if I was doing it. So, like, I have nothing to say that's not being said by, like, 30 other people right now. Which is cool. Like, it frees me up. Because uh, for a long time there were things I had to say, and now there's really not anymore. Um, Pervy Vitcon asks, what do you think about Dantalian no Shoka? I remember it was pretty interesting. Uh, you know, it, it was like, after Pantheon stocking it, another Gynax show that was like a uh anthology show but obviously like way less inventive so it kind of like paled in comparison to that but it still was cool that it was at all like a weird inventive uh show like that you know um i just kind of got i think i watched ha half of it and i just didn't care enough to continue but i thought it was interesting and the ending theme was fucking out there and that was great um Anon191 asks, thoughts on Futakoi Alternative? I think it's fucking awesome. I haven't watched it since 2007, but I love everything that it was and stood for, and I wish Ufo Table was still making shows like that. Pretty Flacco asks, hi Digi, just got into your videos, they are amazing. Couple of questions, what's your favorite movie by David Lynch? What's your favorite song by Joy Division? And what do you think about the manga Shamo? Never heard of Shamo. Uh, the only David Lynch movie I think I've seen is Eraserhead, so I guess that one. And, uh, what's your favorite song by Joy Division? I don't listen to Joy Division, so I don't have one. Unicorn Jedi asks, do you have an IRC channel? I do not. I have, at various points in history, have been an IRC person, and then after stopping, completely forgotten how it works. Like, I like I know there's a time where I knew what IRC was like, but I don't remember anymore how to use it. Um, 
so yeah i I mean what why bother why do I need an i r c channel it, it seems like it'd be completely useless to me. Have you read or watched Ajin? Uh, I'm reading the manga and absolutely loving it. It's also an absolute blast from the start. Uh, I watched like half the first episode and was not into it at all, but uh, I don't know. Maybe I could give the manga a shot someday. Howlin' Bat asks, Why do you think so much anime and light novels miss or leave out fundamental structure for story and characters? You'd think that writing a story would be the most basic thing you'd focus on in an anime production. You've pointed out plenty of examples in your videos, both SAO and Astro Score, but do you have an opinion on why it is so common? Uh... You know, I think part of it is, like, I'm not a big story and plot guy myself. I don't necessarily subscribe to the idea that, like, a great story is the the core. I should say a great plot, because I do think great stories are necessary, but I also think stories come in a lot more forms than just plot. I think just having characters in a work, like, if they're interesting characters, then that's a story in itself. Like, you know... Like, I love Slice of Life shows where it's just about showing some characters, and if I like them, then that's enough to go on. And I think that's what a lot of these light novels are trying to do. They're trying to just be like, hey, here's some characters that you'll love, um, and let's follow them in an action story. You know, let's just throw them into an action story. The problem is that their idea of character you'll love is character that fits to pre-established archetype of character you loved in the past drawn by a decent artist. So that's why we have this overwhelming Sundere phenomenon, because at some point in history there was a Sundere character who people actually liked. Like, let's say, maybe Louise from Zero no Tsukaima was pretty popular in, in that era when Sundere's were exploding in popularity. Uh, and then everyone else just wanted to make a character that's like Louise. But they didn't really copy why she was the way she was or, like, what makes her interesting or likable as a character. They just copied the template of Sundere, pink-haired girl, you know? Uh, and then a decent artist draws it, and people look at the cover of the book, and they go, wow, that girl's cute, I'll buy that book. And then they just mindlessly read it. Um, and it somehow sells, because the characters are, they look attractive, and that's enough a lot of the time. Very European asks, you obviously like Game Grumps, but what do you think about Super Best Friends Play? I mean, if you even watch them. I've never seen any other videos all the way. I've seen, um like, clips here and there, and some stuff I thought was funny, but for the most part, it just... And I've talked to Liam of them in my podcast, uh, because he's friends with Mother's Basement, but I don't really know their work that much. Mikayak11 asks, Ever watched the second season of Darker Than Black? I only saw the first episode, uh, so not really. Loomer93 asks, Thoughts on Gravity Falls? I watched the first... 10 episodes i think of season one just never got around to finishing it um when the show started i somehow caught on to it like immediately uh and i watched the first three episodes and i thought they were fucking amazing like i thought it was one of the funniest shows i'd ever seen uh and episode four was solid and then after that it just kind of was less and less funny each week to me and i was was only like so so into it um and then i just kind of fell off the wagon watching it but uh i still thought it was enjoyable and i've heard that it gets amazing in season two haven't gotten around to it another moog asks i'm sure you get this question absolutely all the time but i couldn't really find a definitive answer anywhere allow me to just say i'm relatively indifferent on sao as a whole though i can't stand the fan base so yeah what i'm asking is your general opinion on the character of yuki in the mother's rosario arc uh so basically i haven't seen it i watched the first two episodes of mother's rosario with victor and we recorded a commentary on it, which I think I might have the files for that still on my computer somewhere. But the problem is that we paid no attention to the episode at all. And I really don't know what happened in those two episodes. So I have to rewatch them if I want to finish the Mother's Rosario arc. Um, and I would like to eventually do some kind of video on Mother's Rosario, but I don't know what kind. And I feel like I don't want to do it until we have a definitive release date, either for the SAO movie or for season three, because I want to do it once there's like 
interest again. Like, not that people aren't still talking about SAO, but, like, I'd rather it be at a time when, like, the iron is hot and ready to be struck, you know? BioRZ-esque asks, On your latest review of Erased, I noticed you talking about Figure 17 as an anime where they portray children in an accurate way. I didn't know how accurate that was or what exactly you meant with that, but it still got me very curious since I'm an amateur writer and like to speculate on what level of logic certain characters should have. I noticed that you only watched four episodes of that particular anime, but I still watched it to completion anyway. I won't spoil anything, but the ending made me question whether to take it as an amazing story or a really bad one. Still haven't decided. The reasons for that cannot be explained without telling you the plot point, so it would be better if you answer this once you're done with it. Please tell me your opinion on it once you're done. It's driving me crazy. Still haven't finished it yet. Sorry. Um, ADM21 asks, Have you listened to The Life of Pablo since Kanye finished it? And if so, has your opinion improved? Not really. I, li- I did listen to the finished version. I didn't think it was, like... I mean, it was... The sub-bass sounded better, but all the songs that were shit were still shit. I do really like the video for Famous, though. The one with the, uh... Everyone... The giant orgy. Um, Unemployed Shinigami asks, Did you watch Haito Genso no Grimgar? Nope. Uh, Gargantastical... Or Gargant... Gar- Gurgtastical asks... Have you had the chance to check out Is It Wrong to Try to Pick Up Girls in a Dungeon? Well, I already did a video reacting to that one. Um, Winter Wacko asks, what's your opinion on South Park? It's pretty good. I've never been someone who avidly watches South Park. I've seen quite a few episodes, though, throughout my life. Uh, and I've seen the movie a number of times. And it's good, fun stuff. I like it. SheMCC2 asks, do you think that debate is a part of critical thinking? I, I guess so. Uh, Game Over 5, but with a bunch of numbers in it, asks uh, four questions. What do you think of Goat Jesus' analysis of FMA 2003? Did it change any opinion you had on the show? I thought it was interesting. It did not change my opinions about the show uh, because it comes down sort of to his reading, and I don't really read it that way. Um, number two, what are your thoughts on Eager After Sequelitis on Zelda? I think that the thing about that video is that, like, the problem with it, and I think Eager Raptor has recognized this since, is that he's presenting a very fringe opinion as though it were a more common opinion. Or, like, he expects people to agree with it. Where, like, the things that bother him about Ocarina of Time are very specific stuff that I don't think most people think of in the way that he does. And... The appeal of Ocarina of Time is so vast and not really covered in that video. Like, there's so much he doesn't say about it that's so important. And, uh, like, sort of, like, before he even made his video, his points that he had made about the game in his, uh, like, in Game Grumps had been, like, refuted. Super Bunny Hop has a great video, um, his video, uh, Critical Close-Up Zelda, where he compares... Um, a Link to the Past against Ocarina of Time way before Eager After actually got around to doing it in full and just talks about how, like, how much there is in Ocarina of Time that just improves the feeling of it so much. And that video is a, a great counterpoint to Eager Raptors. Now, I don't think Eager Raptors wrong about anything he says. I think it's perfect. Like, he explains himself very well. I get where he's coming from with all of his opinions. It's just that... Most people don't feel that way, and he's presenting it in such a way where it's like he, like he's almost exasperated with the fact that people don't seem to see it his way. Um, so I think if he had presented it more like this is just me, I'm just a crazy man, that it would have probably come across better. All right. Uh, do you think anime as it is today needs to start making more mature content and try to experiment to different audience? Uh, yes, I do think those things should happen. I don't know if they need to, but I definitely think they should. Uh, number four, what are some of your favorite electronic albums? Uh, if they count, Anamanaguchi's Endless Fantasy would definitely be my favorite electronic album. Um, I don't know if that counts, though. It's like chiptune rock, borderline metal music. Uh, I don't really listen to a lot of electronic music, I guess. Um... Yeah, I don't know. 
Winter Wacko asks, after knowing you have seen and liked Jinro the Wolf Brigade, have you seen the other two films by Mamoru Oshii in the trilogy or have any intention to? If so, would you ever do a video about them? I'd like to watch his other weird live action movies. I think that would be a good time. Um, th they're all movies that I mostly have heard negative things about, which is why I never watched them. But I'm way past that as a person. <laughs> Same thing happened with Hideaki Anno's films. People, like, shat all over those, but I watched them and I thought they were fucking great, so... Um, Alright. M4TI140 asks, Also, Sakura so no Pet Nakanajo. Uh, I kind of talked about that in my Things I Want from Anime Romance video. Like, the things that bothered me about the show that made me drop it, I talked about in that. Um, he also asks, Clanad, the whole thing. I've only seen... Mostly the first half of Clannad. I thought it was boring and at parts stupid. The Kotomi arc is fucking insufferable. I think that the the whole part where Tomoya becomes a gardener for like an episode and a half is one of the most laughably stupid like, ham-fisted things that I've ever seen in anime. And I kind of... It's almost awesomely bad for me. Like, I kind of love how stupid it is that he has, like, this whole existential gardening scene for an episode and a half out of nowhere. <laughs> it's so bad. Um, don't really care for Clannad. I watched the first two arcs of Aster After Story, I think, like, the first five or so episodes. I thought it was okay. It was better than the original show, uh, but I just didn't care enough to keep watching. Kajelja10 asks, Do you have some kind of system to organize everything you're watching, or do you just watch whatever you feel like at the moment? Pretty much just whatever I feel like, aside from the current um, finish or fail series with the randomizer. I kind of just get into like certain modes where I'll be like, I'm going to watch everything from 2015, or at least as much of it as I can, or I'm going to watch a bunch of shows in this genre, like when I did, well, just watched an insane number of rom-coms uh, last year, or when I watched everything from 1991 out of nowhere, uh, you know, just stuff like that. I just get on like a kick, and then I'll watch like a shit ton of anime in one specific genre, uh, or, 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 or group category or whatever. Pepeke asks, Hi, could you make a list of the most influential anime, the stuff that really set the trends then defined the medium? There are bits and pieces throughout your videos, but I'd like to ask, could you make slash point me to some comprehensive list? I want to make that video. I really want to make like something about like a list of classics or a list of influential shows. I don't feel comfortable doing that until I've seen those shows because like there's a huge difference to me between like when you read online or in like an article like this show was highly influential and like you you kind of get that it's influential but when you actually watch a show that you can see how it influenced other shows then it's like a world of difference like you know you could talk about like how influential Osamu Tezuka is and be like uh, a show like Blackjack and I can see, like, elements of influence of Blackjack and other stuff, but not, like, to a huge degree. Whereas, like, Mobile Suit Gundam, I, I can, like, point to any number of shows and be like, that's from Gundam, that's from Gundam, that's from Gundam. Like, it's so clear where its influence comes from. Uh, and I can do that because I've watched Gundam, you know. So, like, if I'm able to watch more of the older shows and then I can, like, really point to what, what they influence, then I'd be able to do something like that. All right, I'm getting into the realm of uh, where I've answered a lot of these already in text, so I'm going to uh, just skip around and find the ones that I haven't answered yet. Uh, Throwtail says, just finished your Konosuba video. Were you satisfied with how the show ended, and what, in your opinion, will the production team need to do in S2 to keep the show interesting and not a rehash of S1? I asked this because I felt like there were some moments late into the first season where the running gag seemed a little overused, and I hope that won't get worse with ten more episodes. Yeah, I pretty much agree. I think the ending was fine. Um, the show definitely was, like, riding on that line towards the, like, on the back half where it was like, this is still fun, but it can get old if it never goes anywhere, you know? I don't think they have to necessarily leave the village or anything, but, like, I don't want the entire rest of it to just be, like, episodic gag scenarios. Especially because what was so great about the first, like, five or six episodes was how each one, like, kind of flowed into the other, where, 
Like, they, they were kind of building on each other, and then I don't think it did that as much in the second half. Uh, there was still an element of that uh, where, you know, things would come back, but the episodes felt more individual in the second half of the show, and I don't know if I want that. But I also understand that they, like, mixed up parts of the volumes uh, in that one, like, in order to create a better, like, flow in the show, so I don't know how it'll be for season two. Mr. Cool Sponge asks, any thoughts on one meme man, one punch man, other than it looked amazing? Anything to say about the setup, characters, humor, etc.? I think I talked about this in some video recently. Uh, I, I enjoyed it a lot. Really thought the first episode felt like a, an amazing standalone film. And after that, it had moments where it was really interesting, but a lot of it just felt like I was just watching a, like a shonen fight show. Uh, and that stuff's not bad, but it it felt so much like Hunter Hunter while being much worse than Hunter Hunter. And like, oh, I'll tell a fun story. So back in like, God, what was it? Like early this year, I want to say like April or so, there was like a period where I was trying to come up with like what was my next show that I was going to write like a novel about. Because like I writing Asterisk War was so fulfilling and I wanted to do the same thing with like a positive show. But I wanted it to be something popular and recent so that it would be like relevant to people, um, you know, and like get people excited about it. So I thought about One Punch Man, which I'd only seen the first episode of at the time. But I got like really hype about the idea like that – like that surely One Punch Man, because it's, it's great, and surely someone needs to break it down on a deep level. Because it's like the most relevant show of the last couple years, and it's both very popular and very good. And like leading up to One Punch Man coming out, like uh, all year last year, I was struggling with this thing where I wanted to cover a popular show that I would love. That's like been, it's kind of been like a dream of mine ever since I started covering anime is that there will be a show that is at the perfect intersection of I love it and it's popular and I'll get to write about it right when it's relevant at pe you know peak interest and cover it in a lot of depth. That's been my dream. I got to do like, uh, you know, Hunter Hunter. I got to do a video about that at a time when it was pretty relevant, um, and but I didn't, you know, it, it was it was already over for a bit, and um, and I caught on to it late, so it wasn't like the best timing. But I want to have a show that like comes out and like right from episode one, I'm on board and it gets really popular and I get to cover it. And for a lot of 2015, I was hoping One Punch Man would be that. Like I kind of had a lot of hopes riding on it turning out to be that show. But when it was actually running. I didn't really end up watching it or talking about it because I was doing other stuff. And so finally in like April, I'm like, you know, One Punch Man is still very relevant. It's just about to start on Toonami. I should just try to do that. I should write like a book about One Punch Man. And I got all hyped about it. And then I watched the show and I thought it was great, but I didn't have enough to say about it for a novel for sure. And then what really made it sink in at the end was when I realized that if I wanted to do that, I should just do Hunter Hunter. Because by the end of the show, I was like, this show has some cool ideas and all, but Hunter Hunter has so many more cool ideas and is just so much more vast and interesting that it that Hunter Hunter really deserves a novel written about it. So, you know, that kind of deflated me towards writing about One Punch Man and uh I also had wanted to write a video just about the fight scenes in that show and, like, how well done they are, but Canepa made his videos about the animation techniques, which covered a lot of what I wanted to say, and then Nino recently made a video about how to do good action scenes, which kind of covered the rest of what I would have wanted to say, so I feel pretty well covered on that one. Uh, watch both of those videos. All right, Winters Blah asks, I really dig your ability to analyze and critique anime and television and have wanted to develop the skill for myself. Any ideas where I could flesh out analytical skills? Uh, your brain, just write a lot, watch a lot of shit, think about everything, and write as much as you can. As my username implies, I'm also a writer of my own merit. I just realized his name is Writers Blah and not Winters Blah. 
whenever I end up finishing my current novel, is there any chance we could work out an agreement to get you to read my book before I send it out for editing and publishing in order to finish it up? No, because everyone asks me that. The nature of being a critique, like a guy who critiques writing, is that every writer wants me to critique their writing. Um, the thing is that I don't enjoy that. Like, uh, like reading like amateur works and giving advice on them. I, I'm not into it. Uh, because I don't really analyze just everything. Like I'm, I'm not the type of person who writes a review of something because it's there. I write a review of something cause I'm interested in it. Like everything I talk about on my channel is stuff that I already have a vested interest in. Um, you know, I tend to drop things very easily I am very picky about what things I like, and I don't read a lot. So, like, when people want me to proofread their work or give advice about stuff, like, you know, like, look at their stuff and just tell them, like, what do you think, uh, I tend to shy away from it because, like, I don't think I'm the best person to be critiquing your work because I'm not the target audience. Like, if you're writing a novel and I'm someone who almost never reads novels, then... Like, I can't step outside myself and, like, tell you whether I think other people are going to enjoy it, you know? Like, I'm not the target audience of your novel. Uh, if you made an anime, then I'd gladly review it, you know? Uh, and, if, well, even then, people have sent me their animations, and I've been like, I have no comment on this because it's not my style. Uh, you know, maybe some people would like this, but you got to consider that I am unfucking believably picky, so, like... I don't think that I am the best indicator of whether you've written something good. I am a good indicator of whether you've written something I will like, which is not likely. So that's why I don't usually respond to stuff like that. I just realized I, actu I actually did reply to that guy before, but uh, whatever. AU is heavy asks, have you seen the recent US release of Only Yesterday? I have not, but I have seen the movie. It's great. Shiam Kutu asks, I'm trying to get into rap music for the past year. Any album recommendations? I think Good Kid Mad City is a great place to start, the Kendrick Lamar album. Um, I first started listening to like rap more seriously in 2013 after my friend posted Bitch Don't Kill My Vibe on his Facebook, and I listened to it, and I thought it was fucking great, and I kept listening to it over and over again. And then I listened to more of his stuff, and then I found out about the narrative of the album, and then I got really interested in that narrative, and then I was just completely sold, and I think that album is a classic. Uh, and from there, I started, I got into The Needle Drop, the, al the music reviewer, listened to a bunch of rap albums that he had talked about, and just got into the genre from there. Um, like everything else, I'm very picky, so, like, I don't know exactly what you'll be looking for. I am not, like, into all rap. I'm into, like, a tiny amount of it. But, uh, I think generally Kendrick's a good way to, like, get into the genre in the first place. Um, ADM21 asks, what do you think of Yasuomi Umetsu's work? I don't think I've read any of Yasuomi Umetsu's work. Let me look him up real quick and make sure. Not even a artist. I said red, but he's like a he's a character designer. Oh, he's the guy who did Kite and Mezzoforte and uh, Wizard Barristers. He's like a guy who has like interesting ideas and an interesting art style, but like I don't think anything he does is particularly good. And it, it looks like I've probably answered every other question in here, at least all the ones I had answers for. So I've caught up on this. Um, sorry it took so long to get to all these, but from now on, I'm probably just going to answer questions in vlogs if I have answers to them. Feel free to ask me questions down in the comments, uh, and maybe or maybe not I'll get around to them. I just felt like I kind of had an outstanding promise to all these people that I'd answer their questions. And now that promise is taken care of, I make no promises for the future. But if you ask me an interesting enough question, I might make a video response to just that question and, uh, and do that as a vlog thing from now on. So, peace.